Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very important uh, preliminary budget hearing uh, of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. We are first going to hear from the three presidents and CEOs of our public libraries, and then we're going to hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and then we're going to hear public testimony, and I know a few people have uh, signed up for libraries, and I also know that um, as we start with libraries, our friends from the cultural world are in the house and well represented, so, um, and apparently pretty rowdy this morning. <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure you will uh, appreciate and love our libraries as we talk about libraries. Uh, and then we'll hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs and then take public testimony. Uh, so to all of the folks who are here for libraries, um, know that I am with you and, and stand with you, as does the City Council. We have, uh, I think, a really good track record for me over the last 21 years, but uh, for the last 10 as the chair of this committee. Uh, and I know working with Speaker Johnson, um, we're gonna continue to fight for our public libraries. And I said outside at the, the rally, uh, the work that you all do, the work that our public libraries um, do in serving our public is so important uh, all the time in good times and bad, that uh, we should always be talking about what more we can do for libraries and, and not uh, coming from a place of scarcity or, or weakness, right? We are a strong and mighty community, a strong and mighty force uh, for good. Uh, uh, just about anything good uh, that, that happens in this city couldn't happen without libraries and without library workers, and, and, uh, and we've uh, gotten to a good place on public libraries in this city, but we can do even better. And, and I want to frame the discussion there and, uh, uh, and make sure that we're all working towards that goal. So we are uh, anxious to hear from our three presidents and CEOs, uh, and then we will turn uh, to the wonderful world of culture and the arts in New York City, uh, and then come back to some of the folks who are library workers who uh, wish to testify, as well as many of the folks from the cultural community who have signed up to testify as well. Um, and today is a busy day of lots of hearings, so members will be coming uh, in and out of the hearings, but I didn't want to keep the presidents and CEOs waiting uh, uh, any longer. So um, without further ado, and in the order that they so choose, uh, we'll hear from <clears throat> Dennis Walcott, the President and CEO of the Queens Library, Linda Johnson, the President and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, and Tony Marks, the President and CEO of the New York Public Library. So however you all choose to begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. I'm Dennis Walcott, President and CEO of the Queens Public Library, and it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Chair Van Bramer, Speaker Johnson, and the members of this esteemed committee for the opportunity to speak with you about our budget priorities for the next fiscal year. So before I start with my written testimony, I would just want to modify one thing that you said, Chair. You said you have a very good track record. You have an excellent track record. Uh, it's better than very good. And what you and the members of the committee and John, uh, the speaker and others have done has been continuous support for our libraries. And I just wanted on the public record that it's been an excellent track record. And we really, really appreciate everything that you do for us because you have made us the thriving institutions that serve the public in New York City. And as you well know, public libraries play a critical role in our society. 
We are the last open democratic institution that seeks to transform people's lives by providing free access to knowledge and information and by creating opportunities for growth and empowerment to all. Libraries are for everyone, regardless of a, a person's background or identity. The public depends on us for outstanding program and services, broadband access, and trustworthy information to improve the quality of their lives. It would be impossible for us to meet their needs without your steadfast support and leadership. Therefore, it is with deep gratitude that I thank you on behalf of every person who works at and is served by the Queens, Brooklyn, and New York Public Libraries. We collectively appear before the committee today to discuss our fiscal year 2020 operating and capital needs. As you know, New York City's libraries are asking for $35 million in operating funding for fiscal year 20 and $900 million in capital funding under the city's 10-year plan. I am happy to report that fiscal year 2018 was another busy and productive year for us at Queens Library. We welcomed over 11.4 million customers, a 2% increase from the previous fiscal year, and saw substantial increases in visitors in several of our locations. For example, uh, in our North Hills Community Library, had an 18% increase in visitors. Uh, the Forest Hills Community Library had a 13% increase. Peninsula had a 9% increase. And the Flushing Community Library, and this is always a tough stat for me to believe, had an increase of 7%. And why I say that, Flushing is just so busy, no matter what time of the day you go there, it's just full of people. So for Flushing to have a 7% increase is a tremendous testimony to what's happening at all of our libraries. The library's books, DVDs, and magazines, and other materials circulated 12.4 million times at Queens. Our dedicated and creative staff uh, have worked tirelessly to find ways to serve the public in innovative ways uh, within and beyond the walls of our libraries. Last summer, we launched our book cycle. Matter of fact, Chair, you were on the book cycle with your helmet, and we have pictures, so anytime you need that, we have it for you. Outfitted with a book display and free Wi-Fi service within a 100-foot range, allowing our librarians to ride to various locations and provide the public with our services. Our librarians from eight branches formed the Queens Library Robotics League to bring robotic teams to our system. And the competition is already kicking off and it is heavy and it's cutthroat and they're talking about all their robotics teams and how they're gonna beat the other one. Moreover, our outreach team had story times in local hospitals, homeless shelters, and laundromats to bring the joy of reading and discovery to families who otherwise would not be able to benefit from our programs. Over three million people used our computers or accessed our Wi-Fi network, and in December 2018, we made it easier for our customers to access our Wi-Fi by removing the prerequisite of entering a library card number. Now, all of our customers, whether they have a library card or not, can instantly connect to our Wi-Fi at any of our 65 locations. We have also tripled our internet bandwidth, thereby providing even faster service to the public. Queens Library offered 87,500 programs during fiscal year 2018, and customer attendance of more than 1.5 million surpassed the all-time high we set for our system just last year by 8%. For too many Queens residents, the digital divide provide, uh, presents barriers to education, job opportunities, and responsibilities of daily living. Approximately 30% of the borough does not have broadband access or a computer at home. In certain communities, that number is much higher. In addition to presenting everyday obstacles, this divide can create significant problem affecting the amount of funding the city receives from the federal government and our representation in Congress. With the Census Bureau's emphasis on having people complete the 2020 Census online, the library will undoubtedly play a critical role in ensuring an accurate count. And let us be clear, the city will not be able to get a complete count of its residents without the assistance of all of our libraries working in tandem with the cities and others. Therefore, we look forward to working with both sides of the city hall in the weeks and months ahead to secure resources for outreach and training and equipment necessary to count every New Yorker and succeed in this vital mission.
Universal six-day library service exists because of this council and you, Mr. Chair and Mayor de Blasio. On behalf of every New Yorker, especially the people who visited Queens Library on a Saturday in fiscal year 18, a total of 1.6 million times we say thank you. As has been stated previously, the funding that we received several years ago was just enough to make six-day service a reality. Deep down in our collective hearts, we know that we are not providing the full level of service to our customers need and deserve. And another quick aside, so this past Saturday, a couple of days ago, I was in the library uh, to do some work, and then I walked in and I saw a long line of people, and I was trying to figure out, what's the long line of people there for? And they were there to get their taxes done, and they were there for free tax service. And then I went upstairs, and I heard some noise on the second floor at the Queens uh, Central Library, and then I peeked my head and there was a room full of students, adult students, who were getting ESOL classes. And that's what we do. We provide a variety of services now, six and for some of us, seven days a week as well. Uh, when the city empowers libraries, it empowers individuals, families, and communities. Libraries are the heart of creating a fairer city. So we stand ready and able to make that vision a reality. And for us to do this, we respectfully request $35 million in expense funding in the mayor's fiscal year 2020 executive budget, of which $9.7 million would go to the Queens Library. And as you know, there's a formula we follow. Uh, this figure includes $8 million that the speaker, speaker John Johnson and the City Council provided to libraries this fiscal year. We cannot afford to lose that money as well. It is of the utmost importance that at minimum the Council restore the investment for fiscal year 2020. However, it would truly make a difference if the Council were able to enhance that figure. This funding is critical to us as it supported vital library operations such as staffing program collections and critical maintenance projects. When you consider the fact that the administration has looked to cut funding to libraries, reauthorizing and potentially increasing this funding funding is of great importance. While we appreciate last year's funding, it does not keep pace with the rising costs related to health care, insurance, and inflation. Further, the $2 million that the administration allocated to DDC for libraries to address capitally ineligible projects was an actually, uh, actuality for libraries and culturals, and we respect our culturals and their needs as well, and could not be used by any of the systems to address our vast critical maintenance needs. Without increased funding, we will need to make serious decisions about our operations that will negatively affect our customers. Consequences may include reduction of operating hours, inability to have fully uh, staffed community libraries, decrease in email, um, e-materials, outdated information, less program, inability to address critical maintenance issues resulting in costly or capital projects. Let me reiterate, though, that libraries create a fairer city, and as we continue to connect with the new populations, it provides with us more opportunities to transform people's lives. Um, and in order to properly serve the people of this great city, we need clean, safe, modern, and inspiring spaces. Queens Library has more than one million square feet of library space and all of it is heavily used. Furthermore, over the next decade, we will add an additional 50,000 square feet to our system's footprint. Maintaining our physical spaces is no small feat. We have identified a capital need of nearly $270 million over the next 10 years to modernize all of our facilities and bring them into a state of good repair. For fiscal year 2020, the library has projected at least a $47 million need to fund new projects and address shortfalls for several pending renovation and expansion projects. Thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to speak today, and I now turn it over to the esteemed doctor uh, from the New York Public Library, Dr. Tony Marks. Doctor? Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. So I, I uh, just want to interrupt a thundering applause for Dr. Tony Marks um, <laughs> to say that uh, we're actually not allowed to applaud, believe it or not, in the council chambers, but you can do this every time you're happy or you agree with something. So let's practice. Do you all believe that libraries should get more money in this year's budget, right? Do you all believe that culture and the arts should get more money in the budget? Do you all believe that Tony Marks is a wonderful man? <laughs> <laughs> well, Linda didn't put your hands up. <laughs> it was oh, yeah. good. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Good morning, and uh, thank you again, as uh, we're always happy to repeat, because it's true, 
so grateful to your leadership, to the City Council's leadership, and of course to the Mayor and the City for, for everything that they've done and that you have done uh, steadfastly. Um, I could sit here and speak about the moment in our democracy um, inspired by this room, uh, and, I, and we all are very conscious of how essential libraries are for protecting our democracy, for helping our citizens inform them, skill them, prepare them, um, even help them vote, help them be counted. Um, those issues are you know, in the forefront of all of our uh, thinking at this point. But today I'm going to focus a little more on the ground um, to say you have made it possible for us to do so much more the city has requested us to do so much more, and the evidence of our ability to do that is very clear on the ground. So let's move from rhetoric to where we live. Some examples. In recent years, we've begun to use libraries as community conversation spaces, self, uh, safe spaces for discussions about civics, mental health, opioid epidemic, Accessibility, inclusion between police and neighborhoods, essential and really cannot happen in any place other than the safe space of the library. In English language instruction, again, on the requests of the city's mayor and city council, we've uh, doubled our seats and more than 500% increased our enrollments uh, since uh, 2012 in English language. We've um, helped more than 5,000 people uh, through our citizenship classes to achieve citizenship. We've seen a massive increase in our computer skills training because it is essential for work in the 21st century. We're now at the New York Public, close to 120,000 people attending those programs. We have close to 3 million computer sessions, 3.3 million wireless sessions. Uh, in addition to our Wi-Fi lending for those people who can't get to the library and can't afford uh, uh, broadband at home, um, we've seen thousands of people benefit from that program. We are so proud to have been able to partner with the city in everything that you have asked for and everything that the mayor has asked for, whether it's Early literacy, preparing kids to do better at school once they leave the library, or not leave the library, but move into school, but we get them typically first. We've seen a 137% increase in our early literacy programs in the last two years. We're at close to 800,000 visits to those at this point. Um, the City First Readers program, again, with leadership from the City Council, we're at 110,000 early literacy kits. One Book, One New York, we've been a key partner in that. We've heard the city that we need to reach out to those folks who've been incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. We've created two physical facilities at Rikers and the Manhattan Detention Center and are working with video visitations in eight locations. On the homeless, again, at the request of the city because this is all so important to all of us, Programs that now reach over 6,000 homeless people. IDNYC, the great effort by the, led by the City Council. The New York Public Library has been the place where 20%, the largest single percentage of IDs have been gotten. We're registering voters. As, as um, Dennis said, we're working on the, um, the census. We, uh, we cannot do all of this if we don't get increased funding simply because our costs have increased. We want to do everything in partnership with you, and we're proud of what we have done, but it is simply unsustainable without additional support. The same is true on the capital side. We are so grateful to finally be in the 10-year capital plan where the public libraries of New York should have been for a century. And now you're starting to see the fruits of that. Whether it's bigger branches in Roosevelt Island, Van Cortland, or in East Harlem, McCombs, where we are creating a new library that is five times the size of what was there for decades. Construction is about to begin in Charleston, Staten Island, for a new branch. All of these have real costs 
Um, and that's not even talking about the Mid-Manhattan's transformation into the Nyarcos Foundation Library, our biggest branch. Again, additional services, additional staff, additional hours, all essentially needed, but has to be paid for. Um, the Woodstock branch, renovated in 2016, all of these require additional uh, help so that we can do what libraries need to do. We have an aging footprint. We have talked about that. And we have to not only fully renovate where we can, but also do partial renovations where we can. Some of those are significant. Um, the Francis Martin Library in the Bronx needs $34 million of renovation in a high needs neighborhood where 73% of families speak a language other than English at home. We, um, that branch has made amazing strides in last year. Our adult programming just at Francis Martin is up by 600%. 600%. Um, and that's because this community, all of our communities, need so much more. It's why we're going to fully renovate five of our Carnegies, top to bottom, with a tranche from the 10-year capital plan. There is so much more that we are doing and so much more that we need to do. Let me just be clear, Mr. Chairman. The libraries, everything that we do represents the values of this city and is often a response to the requests from the citizens and the elected officials. All we stand for is what New York stands for. We are so proud to be in the forefront of gathering across differences at a time when that is not happening in this country, respecting and welcoming immigrants in every way at a time when that is not happening in this country, providing skills for jobs and opportunities at a time when that seems stalled in this country, providing connectivity to all the world's wisdom, whether it's in books or on devices, at a moment when that is essential and so many of us take it for granted. Serving kids who need a leg up, serving the incarcerated who need to be welcomed back into our communities. These are all the priorities of this city. They are the priorities now more than ever. The libraries have proved that we are at the forefront. We are right there in every neighborhood doing all of this for the city. And we're super proud that we can do that, but we can't do it if we don't get additional investments, let alone if we see a decrease in those investments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Van Bramer. I thought my colleagues were particularly eloquent this morning. Um, and because it can't be said enough, thank you, thank you, not just for this year, but for all your hard work on behalf of our institutions. Um, thank you also to Speaker Johnson, to Majority Leader Combo, fin Finance Char Drum, and our Brooklyn delegation, and the entire City Council for supporting New York City's libraries. Over the last four years, the city has invested in the growth of libraries, understanding the value we bring to our communities for free, open, and democratic spaces for all. That investment has empowered us to deliver reliable core services six days a week, create responsive new programming, and upgrade our spaces. Today, I urge you to take the next step in fulfilling that commitment allocating $35 million in operating funding for all three systems. This will ensure our growing programs remain strong and our new and expanded spaces are staffed with library workers, program rich, and filled with materials our patrons deserve. Unfortunately, rather than supported this much, supporting this much needed growth, the administration has just asked the three library systems to take a collective reduction of $8 million. Brooklyn's share is $2.5 million. It threatens our ability to deliver on the promise of best-in-class library service. There is no doubt 
that collections, staffing, and hours of service will suffer if we are forced to bear this out. I also ask that you advocate once again to include the libraries in the city's 10-year capital plan. One time in our history, four years ago, libraries were included, helping address long unanswered needs in some of our aging facilities. But 2016 should not be the anomaly. We ask the council to champion our inclusion once again. Recurring capital funding in the 10-year plan is, is essential. Without it, we, we simply cannot efficiently manage our physical plant, which, as you know, is almost entirely comprised of city-owned buildings. The three library systems also request $15 million from the, from the council in capital funds this fiscal year, $5 million for each system to cover critical maintenance. If the 35 million, of the $35 million for consideration, Brooklyn Public Library share is 9.7 million. This funding will support increased collections, programming, and staff, particularly aimed at our new and expanded spaces, as well as funds for maintenance updates in our branches that are not capitally eligible. The size of Brooklyn Public Library's collection is far what it should be for a system serving 2.6 million people. In years past when we faced budget cuts, where possible, Brooklyn Public Library chose to keep staff in place and hours of library service open at the expense of the collection. The toll of keeping the collection budget constant for, for, so, for too long is that many of our materials are aging and outdated. Last year, your allocation allowed us to bring the collection budget up to $10 million for the first time. As part of this year's request, we aim to reach a collection budget of $12 million in order to serve our new and expanded branches. While this would raise to $5 our per capita book budget here in Kings County, New York, it would still be far less than the $10 in capital in Kings County, in per capita in King County, Washington. Demand for our services has soared. Last year, we hosted 8 million visits to our branches, and our materials were checked out more than 13 million times. Library card signups are up 13 percent. And beyond our walls, we offered library service and collections at 200 sites throughout the borough, including schools senior centers, homeless shelters, and correctional facilities. Though patrons continually stream through our doors to check out books, our purpose has expanded beyond making the printed word available to all. In 2018, we offered an astounding 70,000 programs that, that attracted over 1 million attendees, an increase of over 8%. In every branch across Brooklyn, it is standing room only at weekly story time sessions offered in 12 languages as often as possible. And our new Americans Corners are helping smooth the path to citizenship. Patrons rely on English as a second language classes where attendance is up 14% and senior citizens are learning basic computer skills from technology resource specialists in every branch. More than 30, 37,000 programs enriched our children, from literacy programs for those five and under to young adult STEM programming like our Lego Robotics League. We've also introduced exciting and innovative programs, including the first musical instrument lending collection in New York City, and in partnership with Bard College, we now offer the first ever accredited college degree program in a public library. Expanding our work with vulnerable populations, Brooklyn Public Library's Youth Services Librarians filled nearly 500 backpacks with books and materials in multiple languages and delivered them to children waiting in a Brooklyn courthouse after separation from their families at the U.S. southern border. 
Our librarians also offer hospital storytelling, providing children free books and story time programs while they await treatment. Just this month, Emma's Torch opened shop in our library cafe, offering 12-week paid culinary apprenticeships to refugees who learn skills and improve their English literacy while working in the cafe at Central. The growth of library service is not confined to our programs, staff, and collection. It also includes reworking physical locations that were bursting at the seams, inefficiently laid out, and saddled with enormous capital needs. Brooklyn Heights, Sunset Park, and Greenpoint libraries are being entirely rebuilt. With your support, these bigger, new, and inspiring libraries will soon be open to meet the demands of their growing communities. We are also delighted to open Brooklyn Public Library's first new branches in 36 years, beginning with a new library on Adams Street near the Brooklyn waterfront, as well as a new library in downtown, the downtown cultural district. Brower Park Library is moving to a new location in the Brooklyn Children's Museum, affording us a new space in a city-owned building two blocks away from the current leased location. These new branches all require adequate staffing, expanded programming, and additional materials. Staffing needs to include a range of library workers, from librarians and public service managers to increased security and custodial staff. Tapping into the over 1,000 government and community partners we worked with in the past year, Brooklyn Public Library will host more library services off-site than ever before, as many of our branches undergo crucial capital improvements. There's nothing that we hate more than service disruption in a community. Increased funding will help us better address this challenge. With additional outreach librarians building local partnerships and drivers for our bookmobile fleet, at least, and at least one new techmobile in the coming year, we will strive to offer programs in every community experiencing a branch closure. And finally, many of our branches are vulnerable to unplanned cl closures resulting from maintenance issues and equipment failures. Every year we spend precious operating dollars maintaining old boilers, replacing dilapidated furniture, and funding temporary heating and cooling fixes while we wait for long overdue capital projects to be completed. We are funding urgent projects that are either not capitally eligible or are impractical, costly, and time-consuming to address through the city's design and construction <laughs> process. Every summer, we are forced to shut down branches when air conditioning systems fail, and every winter when boilers break. In the last fiscal year, we lost 629 hours to unplanned closures at 35 of our 59 branches. Just last month, Borough Park, Macon, and Washington Irving libraries all closed unexpectedly because of heating failures. Keeping our libraries open is our highest priority, but short-term fixes drain our already overtaxed expense dollars and ultimately take funds away from other worthy library operations. As I stated at the outset, the three library systems are requesting a total of $15 million in capital funding this year to address critical maintenance, $5 million for each system from the council in addition to a capital allocation from the administration. Our current level of capital funding only allows us to tackle the most urgent problems. In Brooklyn, the vast majority of our allocation is swallowed up, filling shortfalls to keep projects afloat. Valuable time and scarce resources are spent responding to emergencies rather than strategically approaching building renovations. Relying on small yearly capital allocations makes it challenging for us to manage capital plans efficiently. Upgrading our buildings piecemeal, system by system, increased costs, elongates timelines, and disrupts communities. Because libraries do not have recurring discretionary funding in the 10-year plan, we cannot draw from future fiscal years to cover current year shortfalls, 
leading to delays and further cost escalation. As I explained earlier, four years ago, the administration included libraries in the 10-year plan for the first time. Brooklyn's funds were earmarked for five full branch overhauls, allowing us to approach building renovations comprehensively. These five projects are underway, and the funding was put to good use, but it did not address the need for discretionary capital funding for the rest of the 1.1 million square feet of physical space we are charged with maintaining. While each library system needs $5 million in this budget year from the council alone, it is equally, if not more important, for libraries to be funded in the city's 10-year capital plan. We implore you to urge the administration to include us once again and definitively categorize library buildings as city infrastructure. Without a recurring source of yearly funding, we are not able to perform necessary preventative maintenance ensure projects continue to move forward when they incur a shortfall, or manage our, physically pl our physical plant, city-owned buildings, in the most efficient way possible. It has never been more important <coughs> for civic institutions to support their communities. In dark times, when truth and access to information is of critical important importance, libraries provide the light. When neighbors want to gather to discuss the day's headlines, libraries provide the safe space. When civic engagement, voter registration, participatory budgeting, IDNYC, and free legal help for immigrants are top city priorities, libraries have taken the lead. With resources and representation at stake in the upcoming 2020 census, the, li the city will rely on libraries, as it should, to help ensure every resident is counted. Now is the time to help us achieve our mission, not the time to cut our operating budget. Now is the time to shore up your investment in libraries and allow us to realize our potential. Millions of New Yorkers are relying on you to ensure that libraries, our most accessible democratic institutions, remain strong for all who come through our doors and that, as promised, they open wide for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Linda, while uh, we all know your name very well, my counsel says that when you began your testimony, you did not state it for the record. So would you state your name and title for the record? For the record, I'm Linda Johnson, President and CEO of Brooklyn Public Library. <laughs> Just the words of your name elicit a massive <laughs> response from the crowd. Um, first, I want to recognize uh, uh, members of the committee, my colleagues who've joined us, uh, Joe Borelli from the great borough of Staten Island, and from uh, the amazing borough of Brooklyn, Ms. Lori Cumbo. Um, and I know both have, have questions. Um, so I'll ask a few and then I'll hand it over to my colleagues and I know we have some others joining us. Um, <clears throat> first, thank you for recognizing uh, the work that this council has done and obviously I'm really proud to have been uh, the chair of this committee now in my 10th year. Um, and I want you to know, I meant to say this earlier, I, I live and breathe libraries, um, so much so that uh, the book I'm reading right now is The Library Book by Susan Orlean, which I'm sure a lot of folks in this room <clears throat> are familiar with. And uh, for my colleagues who may not be reading the book right now, it's a fascinating story about uh, the uh, um, terrible fire at the Central Library in Los Angeles and, and then using that as a way to actually talk about the history of, oh, look at that. <laughs> Joe Borelli on point in this committee <laughs> but luckily, their testimony was scintillating, uh, Joe, so uh, you didn't have to break out Cleopatra. But this is a well-read committee, let me just say. Um, but I, I love reading uh, the book. It reminds me just how important uh, the creation of, of public libraries are and that incredible wacky story in those early days in the late 1800s and the early 1900s as the Los Angeles Public Library was um, coming to be. Uh, 
but that uh, uh, a lot of people believed in this institution and knew how important it would be to, to create it. And then we are the uh, caretakers, right? And we are the stewards now. And, uh, and, and we just have to get to a place where no matter where any particular municipality is in its uh, budgetary ebbs and flows, we have got to get to a place where we understand uh, the importance of public libraries and that we have got to uh, shift the conversation once and for all from a place of, of cuts and reductions to a place of what can we do to make sure libraries are open as often as possible, staffed with as many great library workers as possible to help the people who so uh, very much need them. And that's what I, I want for our city and, and uh, and it's so very, very important that we get there. Um, we've done great work, uh, including libraries and the 10-year capital plan for the first time ever uh, was a big victory and the council was really significant in fighting for that inclusion and we've got to do that again. Uh, the baselining that we have experienced, obviously we feel very good about having uh, fought for that. Uh, the level of funding that we saw last year um, is obviously something we fought for, and we need to not only maintain the gains, but uh, expand what we are able to do for our libraries. So I wanna ask uh, all three systems um, to talk a little bit about what you were able to do with the funding you received last year, um, both pro programmatically and uh, staffing-wise. Um, uh, we were able to do some really good things, uh, both the council and the administration working together, and libraries had a very good year. And if you can, with the staff, talk about um, uh, union, non-union. So programmatic, what you did with the, the funding, and then staffing, union, non-union, all of that. So I'll start, and I mean, with the money that we receive, we've been able to increase our programming, and as Tony indicated, I think, in video visitation, uh, we've seen an increase in the number of visits, and uh, the services have been received. In addition to that, we've been able to uh, deal with increasing our collection budget, as well as staffing patterns, and when I finish the general part, I'll go to the specific chart on talking about the breakdown of staffing as well. I think as Linda indicated, with the expansion of our space uh, requires the expansion of staff as well. And so we've been able to grow staff to meet those space demands and that's always the unique challenge for us. And as a result of that, we also been able to, for Queens and I imagine the other systems as well, on the capital side, been able to really devote a lot of the capital money for needed work. And even though we've talked about the capitally ineligible dollars that put pressure on our expense budget, through the capital side of it, we've been able to take a look at new roofing, masonry, air conditioning, and really upgrading the systems. And we've been very lucky, as you well know, Chair, in Queens, both through the city council and through the borough president, as well as the exec side, of having a lot of capital money flow in, but I think the additional money from uh, the council has allowed us to really target it in a very important way. We always face, I think, the strain of the capital needs not necessarily being met based on the original projection. So you will always, as you well know, hear increase in capital needs. So the increased capital budget has allowed us to plug some of those gaps that have existed. So you'll come in with an estimate at X, but then an X turns to Y and Z. And so uh, the additional capital money has helped us to do that. With staffing, our staff breakdown is that uh, from 7118 in Queens to 2119, we have 976 union, 144 non-union hourly rates of 751 for a total 1,871 uh, staff. And when you take a look at that, uh, we've been able to really maintain, I think, a very healthy uh, representation of staffing throughout the uh, Queen system and hires uh, from 7118 to 2119. Uh, we hired 27 
union, 21 non-union for a total of 48. Uh, from 7117 to 63018, we hired 64 union, 22 non-union, and then going back earlier, uh, 61 union and 31 for 92 total. So we've been increasing our staffing as well as far as uh, union representation. So we've been trying to be very targeted with the funding. Uh, but the final thing in response to your question, at least from the Queen's side, is that this money has allowed us, and I think Linda referred to it in her testimony, to plug gaps as well. And so when we see those gaps, we've been able to really be very diligent with the gaps because those gaps and the capitally ineligible gaps have been really eroding our expense budget, and we have to be very conscious of that. So can I, ju I just want to follow up. First, let me also recognize we've been joined by uh, Francisco Moya from Queens, uh, also a member of the committee. Um, so Dennis, just roughly speaking, because I think this is important, right? There was a, uh, a significant amount of funding that was allocated uh, last year uh, to libraries always wanted to be more, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, not all of that was baselined. Uh, and so it's important for folks to realize that um, folks who may have been hired in the last year, and uh, um, we wanna make sure that uh, we're in a position not only to maintain all that we have, but even bring even more people on, uh, because you're gonna need even more library workers. Um, to keep up with the demand and the increase uh, uh, in both libraries and, and uh, you know, sheer space that you got to cover. So can you, the, the number of new folks that were hired in the last uh, several months, um, do you have a ballpark figure of what that number was? And, and uh, if we were not able to uh, restore that uh, funding that you got last year at the same level, um, would there be anyone in jeopardy? So, at least from the Queen's perspective, I mean, as you know, as CEOs, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we balance our budget, and so we have to do our projections, and we're doing our modeling right now at Queen's, and we're taking a look at various scenarios as far as if funding is not coming in, or, God forbid, we lose funding, what that would entail. And so we've taken a look at some of the alleys and the impact on alleys, some of the non-union as well. And so we have a couple of scenarios in place depending on what happens with the future budget. We've cut our OTPS like crazy and trying to make sure we balance our books. And so our OTPS is at a bare minimum if it exists at all. Uh, so that way we can protect the staffing to the best of our ability. Uh, but at the same time, we have a fiduciary responsibility based on the funding cycle. So we're looking at a variety of scenarios, but we continue to high, but hire, but it's not as robust right now because, again, we have to be extremely responsible as far as not just hiring to hire and then not having money there in the future to support that. So right. we're being very conscious of that. And we should, we should be talking about <clears throat> doing more for our libraries and making sure that we're uh, getting the robust Robust funding we need. Um, so from July 1 of uh, 2018 to today, is there a ballpark figure? That's what I'm trying to get that's from what I, yeah, of you. Uh, that, that's the 27 figure that I mentioned okay. at Queens, and that's Union 21, so 7118 to 2119. Okay. Uh, that's the total of 48. 48. Okay, great. Who's next? Mr. Chairman, the, um, so in terms of the funds, um, the unallocated expense funding from the City Council directly, $3.5 million last year, 1.7 was used to fund uh, important wage increases associated with the minimum wage um, that is such an essential uh, standard for the City to meet, uh, as well as collective bargaining salary increases for non-City funded um, uh, union employees, uh, retroactive payments, $300,000 for overtime expenses in the branches, $1 million for uh, building repairs, maintenance, and equipment, half a million dollars uh, in particular for additional books. After all, OTPS includes books, which we are also an essential ingredient. The, um, I can say that um, in the, the, the size of our union workforce went from FY16, 1450, to about 1502, FY18, I can get a further breakdown to the one year, but that shows the two year uh, trend. Again, um, we know that we need more, uh, more library colleagues uh, because we have more branches, more square foot, more programs, more hours, more days. Um, on the capital side, 
We have currently $565 million of active capital construction projects. That includes the single largest project in terms of dollars in the history of the New York Public Library, the transformation of the Mid-Manhattan into the New Yorkos Foundation Library. And I, you know, I can read out for you all the branches in all the neighborhoods, but the, um, uh, I, I do want to point out that the library, the New York Public Library privately is currently investing $192 million in capital improvements through pass-throughs. So we have, in addition to the great resources that the city has provided, we're putting our own resources uh, to work uh, to, to partner with those. And I have just, uh, since July till now, our hires have been 62 union, 51 non-union. Uh, and of course, there always is, unfortunately, attrition that goes, uh, cuts against that. Steve Hill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for Brooklyn Public Library, um, of course, the, the biggest um, expansion began um, with 2016 and the move to six-day service. The library is currently at uh, 999, let's say 1,000 employees, um, 833 of which are union employees, and in the last uh, fiscal year we hired uh, 10 people, um, all of them union, uh, keeping, but, but keeping our overall uh, uh, staff at a constant. Um, we have um, really uh, put to hard work the capital uh, money that was allocated in the 10-year plan uh, by uh, addressing the five complete branch um, overhauls that were intended for its use. Um, we have at um, uh, three of the five projects uh, are DDC managed, Eastern Parkway, New Utrecht, and Brownsville. Each of those projects is in design. Uh, and there's already been uh, significant community engagement um, and outreach sessions uh, with the public uh, and stakeholders, which will be um, uh, incorporated that feedback into the design. Uh, there will be also um, a new lots, a completely new library, and Canarsie, um, and both of those will be done uh, as pass-throughs, and um, they will be, uh, and there are consultants who are beginning community engagement on those projects. Um, really, the um, most significant thing that has been done with the funding um, over the past four years is to increase programming and the um, individual programs that are offered not only at the central library but throughout the system. And that, I think, um, has been what's driving up attendance in those branches um, as well as participation in programs in general, uh, for which we've become um, well known and um, also. Uh, done, I think, uh, a better job at reaching into harder uh, corners of the community to reach. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before I turn to my colleagues, all of whom have questions, one quick question for uh, Dennis Walcott. Yeah. You and I have uh, uh, toured recently several times the Hunters Point Library. Yes, sir. And wanted to uh, get on the record the latest update and when we might expect to see that library open. So it's, it's interesting in that um, last night I did something that I normally don't do. I was out last night and I was here in Manhattan and then driving down the FDR, I took a look, or driving back up the FDR, I took a look over at the Hunters Point Library and saw the lights on and it really looks lovely from over here. Uh, so based on projections, and again, as we know, it's projections, uh, by the end of March, we may have the uh, TCO, um, and then we'll see what happens from there. We're still projecting summertime, but again, as I think I've been very clear, summer goes through September 24th, um, and so it's not necessarily a July, August, so we have to be very flexible. Uh, we've posted, which we haven't really talked about this before, uh, we have posted uh, the jobs on our site right now, and so we have, as you met, I think, the new manager that's been identified and with hiring up at this particular point, so people have been identified or being interviewed for the job, so we're moving along that line. Books are in place, and once we get full occupancy to do what we need to do in there, we'll still be working on uh, some parallel tracks with DDC. I think 
I think when we were there last, and maybe not, remind me, uh, you saw the projection of the safety glass, so uh, that's being tested out. I'm not sure if it's being permanently installed yet, but I know it's been tested out as far as the various models are concerned. And so just for the committee, so you're aware, uh, part of the pushback that we had with DDC was while uh, some of the railings and the uh, safety glass reached uh, the building department's requirement of four, four and a half feet, we were very uncomfortable with a number of the areas and we were able then to uh, have a redesign where it will be up to seven feet for the safety, especially as you go vertical onto the top floors. So we're excited to see the progress, but again, it's still a very, um, laborious process as far as the various people who are in there and then having multiple contractors who have vested interests for their own unique needs and not necessarily the collective whole. And so we and our team have been managing that and the expectations as well. Uh, so yeah, so it's being gradually outfitting. I think when we were there, the shelving's being put up as well. And so we have things in storage, so we're ready to rock and roll once we get the full clearance to get in there. And then as I think we've said publicly, once we permanently get in there, then we say, give us normally three months to outfit a library for something like Hunter's Point that we're saying, give us five, six months. And so if we get at the time frame they, they set this time, then we'll be in there in a little more diligent way. Well, uh, you and I are there every couple of weeks I am, um, and we uh, uh, touring it together. So uh, it is starting to take shape, which is it's looking uh, like a library. Uh, exciting. Uh, let me go to my colleagues. Joe Borelli first. Yeah, just a quick question. You said you were renovating uh, five Carnegie libraries top to bottom. W which one of those? I'm sorry, for the New York public? Yes, sir. Hold on one second. I will get you the list. 125th Street, Fort Washington, Hunts Point, Melrose, and Port Richmond. We also have major projects going uh, in, in Staten Island, in your district, um, in Charleston, Great Kills, Huguenot, Richmond Town, and Tottenville. Okay, thank you. Lori Cumba. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. I always know that it is budget time when I see the bright orange shirts <laughs> staring out. It's official. It's one of the official signs of budget season. And I always tell so many other groups, you need a color and a t-shirt. It's very powerful. We, we reuse them every year. <laughs> you reuse them, right? Right. <laughs> Wanted to talk uh, just in general to, for all three groups in terms of MWBEs. So we have a, a very rigorous campaign here to increase MWBE participation throughout the city, and given the magnitude of capital resources, and I know it's never enough, but um, given the magnitude of resources that have been contributed, can you speak to your MWBE recruitment process, where it is, how successful it is, where it needs improvement, as it always does, and um, where you're at with your MWBEs? Um, so, of course, through the projects that we're doing with, the D with DDC, the library doesn't, um, doesn't control the subs that are hired for particular projects. Um, but with the projects that are pass-throughs, where we go out with um, requests for proposals, of course, one of the critical um, requirements that we list in the um, documents is the inclusion of WMBEs for uh, our projects. So at Queens, and same with Linda, what Linda just said, but I mean, with a lot of our procurement, our board took a very serious look, uh, and we had a very rigorous board meeting probably around a year ago now, where we are meeting our threshold levels, and we're very proud of that. I don't have the specific figures here, but I'll be glad to make sure that we get it to you. And Do you know what the threshold numbers are? Where are we? Hmm? So I can't hear you, Sam. Above 25 percent, we're above 25 percent, and on awarded contracts at Queens, and um, that's with our goods and services and other types of services we provide. So you're at your threshold, or you're saying you're over your threshold at this point? So. So 
Sung is our general counsel. Sung. I think if, if he's if he's going to uh, expand any more on that, he probably yeah, should to, sit up I know with you that, and yeah. identify himself because sure. he's sort of testifying on the record. Okay. And as my general counsel, he knows that. So, yeah. we, so I mean, we can give you more detailed information, and I'll be glad to do that. Or if you desire, we can have Sung come up, and he can go chapter and verse as far as specifically what we're doing in that area. So I'll abide by your wishes. Well, I'm having a little bit of difficulty understanding the perspective in terms of goals that are set, where you're at with those particular goals. Um, I understand that through the subs, you don't have the control, but do you have the ability to know where you are with the subs as far as their participation and where they are with that? Because yeah. This is an incredible opportunity as far as the amount of capital resources that are allocated. It's, it's a huge opportunity for New York City, but it would also be a huge economic missed opportunity if MWBEs weren't a huge part of the capital plan in order to realize the larger goals. And so just wanted to see where you were with that as well. In terms of Brooklyn, I didn't give you a specific number. And as you can see, there's a flurry of activity going on there while we all try and get you the number that you're looking for. Um, in the case of Brooklyn, uh, with projects that we do control, we're in line with the city's goal of 30%. Um, so uh, obviously, at the New York, we we all take this incredibly seriously. We understand why this is a crucial investment, particularly as we're investing in the branches, which we have to keep doing. Um, when we work with DDC, um, obviously the DDC, and and we follow the city's guidelines, and we're proud to do so. The um, because we're capable of doing some pass-through operations, which require serious. Uh, Private funds, which are stretching us at this point, particularly given the Mid-Manhattan is our biggest such, but at Mid-Manhattan, which is a pass-through, therefore not a DDC project, which also means the citizens of New York get twice as much done at half the amount of time when we manage that ourselves. But in that instance, we are just, we're at 29 or getting close to the 30 percent um, target for MWBE for the Bin Manhattan project, which is our biggest single privately managed project. So we're staying with the targets of the city, and if possible, we'd like to exceed them. Yeah, and with Queens, we have very few of any pass-through at this point, as Tony indicated. I'm sorry, you have very few. Pass-through projects uh -huh. on the capital side, and so all of our projects, for the most part, are through DDC itself. So and through the pass-through project, all three branches feel boroughs feel or pro, uh, systems feel that you're meeting those thresholds on the pass through but when it goes through DDC you're feeling that the, the numbers are demonstrating that you're not meeting those goals no no, no, no I no. wouldn't say that it's just that it's not within it's our not control. in our purview so uh, DDC um, is also you know striving to meet the thresholds that the city's aiming to meet and um, I assume we're in good shape on those projects it, as well and I apologize if I was confusing I I was suggesting that we have some you know we love working with DDC but we also have frustrations because it takes twice as long costs twice as much which is why we allocate when we can, mm -hmm. uh, and we are stretching ourselves private money to pass through so that we can get things done for the citizens faster, cheaper. And in those pass-throughs, which I think the New York public is probably all, all, you know, in a, in a different place. In a different place, position, right. Um, mostly because of the research library and the private funding associated with the research library, but also with the New Yorkos library. That in those privately managed, library managed projects, we are sticking to and, and seek to exceed the, uh, the city's goals of 29 or, or 30 percent in these huge projects. Okay. Well, it's certainly something that we want to continue to look at because, again, this would be a missed opportunity if we didn't continue to push forward for those goals and even to exceed them um, on so many levels. I wanted to uh, dive in a little bit more specifically, of course, into the Brooklyn branch, um, which I spend a lot of time at. So the Brooklyn Public Library's flagship central library is undergoing a large multi-phase renovation. Phase one, which is currently underway, includes infrastructure upgrades and new elements such as a popular library and civic commons. When is phase one expected to be completed? 
So phase one, as you mentioned, is underway and we're, um, we are committed to keeping the library open throughout the construction of all of the entire project. Um, each project is, I mean, each phase is um, scheduled for two years and so um, we are just a few months into the first phase. Do you have an update on 300 Ashland? It's the multi-million dollar, 800 pound gorilla. <laughs> it is the, the question of the moment. Um, I do not. Um, perhaps um, uh, the commissioner can, uh, uh, Finkel Pearl can answer that question. He is in the building, I can see him now. So we will have that opportunity very shortly. Oh, that's wonderful, I'm very happy to hear that. So in the five-year capital plan, about $155 million has been dedicated to comprehensive branch overhaul for five branch libraries. Which are the branches and what is the extent of renovation that the branches are receiving? Um, assuming you're talking to me, um, the, um, give me one second. I'm a little Brooklyn centric. <laughs> we love that. Um, so the five branches that are um, being overhauled with the money from the 10-year capital plan, as I read, are um, um, New Lots, New Utrecht, Canarsie, Brownsville, and Eastern Parkway. Three of them are- Eastern Parkway on Schenectady Avenue? Yes. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so three of those projects are DDC managed. That's Eastern Parkway, New Utrecht, and Brownsville, and each of those is already in the design phase and have already undergone extensive community outreach to hear from our stakeholders what they're looking for in a new or largely overhauled library. There are two projects that are being done as pass-throughs. Um, they are New Lots and Canarsie, and we've retained a consultant to begin community outreach on those projects um, as well, and we'll issue an RSV, RS, RFP for architect s shortly. And just one final question, the Walt Whitman Library, where, where is that in the process of completion uh, or beginning? <laughs> yeah, actually I'm hearing that DDC is just beginning that. With a completion date of when? Did you say 2022? 2022. Three years completion or 2022. And you know the size of that library. In my estimation, it's not a huge project, but I don't want to discount the size of a library by its physical appearance. But no, it's it is. done. I mean, extraordinary work is done there, as in, in all the branches, but it's a, ve it's a small space. All right. I understand loud and clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I understand why the timeline would be less than ideal in many respects for <laughs> Um, my colleague. Um, uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs is in the wings, um, but we want to make sure that Councilmember Moya gets a chance to ask his questions as well. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, all of you, uh, for being here today. Um, then it's always a pleasure to, uh, Same to you, see sir. you, and uh, thank you for all the great work that you're doing for Queens. My best to your mother. Uh, yeah, and I was just going to say, my mother says hello. From last year. I yeah. remember that very well. Please wave. I do. Because <laughs> she's <Yeah>. watching. <laughs> <laughs> tradition is tradition. Tradition, yes, I know. Uh, so now I'm just not going to ask you anything. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for, you've just made my day. Um, but uh, just going into a, a, a couple of issues that are uh, critical in, in high immigrant districts like, like mm -hmm. mine, um, a, adult literacy is a very big um, issue for us and, and programs uh, like the ones that have been uh, performing very well at the, at the libraries, um, in particular in Corona and in Jackson wow. Heights. Uh, the adult literacy programs are just essential. Um, what would the library system uh, be able to do with the expansion of funding for this type of work? Oh, that's key for us, and I imagine all of us, as far as the adult literacy. As I indicated, maybe just before you arrived, uh, Saturday I was at Central 
and I heard just a number of voices in different languages speaking, and it was around adult literacy, and uh, whether it's in the evening hours, during the day, or on weekends, we provide adult literacy programs and have continued to expand those services. So with additional money, we'll be able to not just expand it, but really target where there's an underserved community and making sure we're having those needed services there for the adult literacy, because as you know, in our borough and throughout the city, uh, the need is so great. So we would continue to take a look at where we could target the money and expand and maintain those services. Right. And it's just so critical because, you know, a lot of the parents, uh, you know, their children are the translators for mm -hmm. them in school. And uh, the fact that we're also expanding the Wi-Fi programs inside the libraries, making it uh, faster speeds for people to go and, and kind of learn. Uh, it's just essential that we are able to fund programs like that and start expanding that to, to help uh, um, our communities uh, all over the city, but in particular um, high immigrant communities as well. Uh, and then also, what funding, uh, and maybe you touched upon this before I got here, uh, what funding has been allocated for capital purchases of land and construction uh, in Queens? Well, in particular, in your area, as you know, we're working on a number of projects, and so for Corona, uh, we have Corona fully funded right now, so we'll begin the work soon as far as working with DDC to do the uh, expansion and renovation of the Corona Library, so we've set aside money there. Uh, as you also know in your area, we're about to uh, open or reopen East Elmhurst, and so we're looking sure. at that. Uh, we have projects that are set aside through the funding in a variety of areas dealing with the capital needs of the borough of Queens. And so uh, whether it's boiler replacements, AC, throughout the system, we are taking a look at how we apply those capital dollars. And I think one of our more complex projects that'll be coming up, and we're taking a look at the designs on this right now, is adding a second elevator at Flushing. Uh, Flushing only has one elevator, so how we being able to expand with an additional elevator without closing Flushing is going to be the most unique challenge we have and so our people are taking a look at that and so the allocation of dollars for Flushing and Glendale uh, we have a temporary site in Glendale so we've not allocated for land but uh, we're using the expense dollars quite frankly for the additional uh, space for uh, Glendale while that's under renovation so we have a lot of capital projects going on at this particular point uh, in Jackson Heights as you know we have uh, funded the expansion and renova renovation of Jackson Heights. And so we're really throughout the entire borough taking a look at how we use the capital dollars to enhance our systems and to grow our space in a creative way. Great. Um, so big fan of uh, having our libraries be open seven days a week. Um, and I think it's just important as you know, you said, when the city empowers libraries, we're empowering people, and the way we do that is by having full access and seven days a week. And has that been something that has been sort of considered in, in budgeting this year, uh, what that would be? Um, because we would love to fight to see that we can get uh, seven days uh, going uh, in our library systems here. Uh, we would love that too, um, but no, that's not something that we have in our sites this coming year, um, just because of the uh, large expense that it presents. Um, it's um, over time and uh, it's more expensive uh, to be open on Sundays Sunday. than elsewhere. Uh -huh. But um, it's a great goal and we always have it in our sites. Um, we have to sort of look for it at the right opportunity. Uh, just to reiterate, the, um, you know, we, have, we all have sites open seven days a week, again with yes. thanks, and, and all of our sites are open six days a week. None of that was true, and we have more sites, and long, and you know, so all that's been amazing. But l let's just be again. I just want to be direct here. Um, we have added more programs, more footprint, more hours, more days, more branches, everything to meet the needs of New York, and we haven't, for instance, gotten the increases that ha will enable us to sustain that. So we are literally, we're eager to actually do more, more programs, you know, more services for our communities, which are so vital. But at this point, if we don't get an increase in funding, we can't sustain right. what you have enabled us to do thus far, because as you know, the costs continue to rise. 
money it only goes so far. We similarly, you know, we, and if we have a reduction in funding, then obviously any of that will produce actual reductions in services, crucial services, to New Yorkers who are depending on us more than ever. And on the capital side, um, just to go to the previous conversation, when the city, you know, if we work with DDC and it costs us twice as much money to get things done, the citizens of New York are not getting what they deserve. Correct. Right? We have projects that are vastly beyond their budget, DDC managed projects. That is a huge challenge for us. And it's why, for instance, in the 10 year capital plan, which we have to continue to be in, I mean, that there is no way for us to be rational, efficient, and effective on the capital front without the 10 year commitment. And in our first tranche, we took the five Carnegies and we, went, we took those to EDC to manage instead of DDC. Uh, again, we're looking for creative ways to get you all more bang for the citizens and the city's buck. So if I may, just one quick second, if, with your permission. So my chief operating officer comes to me on a regular basis, correctly so, saying I need money for this capital need or that capital need. But it's not necessarily the capital needs that are funded through our budget. It's capitally ineligible needs that we have to use expense money for. And whether it's a door or whether it's some other type of capital expense that's ineligible for the use of capital dollars, it comes out of our bottom line of expenses. And as our facilities age and all the normal, I mean, to the glass that will be at Hunter's Point, I mean, it's going to boggle my mind as far as maintaining Hunter's Point as we move forward. And those are the challenges that all of us face at our respective sites as far as, again, meeting our bottom line, being responsible from a finance point of view, but at the same time not allowing our facilities to go by the wayside as far as looking shabby or having things stay broken for a period of time. And that's the challenge. So seven days a week, while laudable, uh, we have a tough time right now meeting the requirements for six days a week. And I think people, not here in this room, but people will always say, well, libraries will always be there. Libraries will always have their doors open. Libraries will always provide services, but not really think through of what those services and those doors staying open actually cost us. And that's our responsibility and our collective responsibility. So while I would love to do that, I think our challenge and what we're saying to you today is that not just maintain, but increase, because the increase will allow us to do what's required to provide this great city with great libraries. And I appreciate that. I, I, I think for us, um, it's for us to go and fight to get you that funding, right? It's to make sure that uh, you don't have to come here each year and just beg to keep these libraries open. Uh, it is probably one of the most fundamental uh, and most critical things that we have to do uh, is to really enrich uh, our libraries because this is what helps uh, our children, our seniors, and everyone that walks in those doors. Uh, some of this is we have high communities uh, of, of color uh, and immigrant communities that are suffering the most and we really need to go and, and have real conversations with the administration about the priorities that we set uh, as a body that the libraries are at the top of that list uh, to make sure that you're getting everything uh, that you can because you have provided some great services to the community uh, and to the city of New York. So I just want to thank you for the great work that you do uh, and that we will continue to fight um, this, uh, this year for you guys in the budget. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Here, here. So um, let me just uh, associate myself with Councilmember Moya's call, and and I want to get a picture of everyone's hands up. So if you think that libraries should really be at seven days service, now is the time to do this, right? All right. Look for that on my Instagram page later. Um, so uh, first of all, let me just thank um, our three public library systems. Obviously. Um, there is no set of institutions that do what you do. 
um, in and for the people of the city of New York. And uh, we have uh, got to continue to pursue uh, what we know is, is true universal access, um, and not just information, but the hope that comes with the information. And you all do that uh, better than just about anybody. And so uh, the council has been at the forefront of this fight. Uh, and we will continue to be at the forefront of this fight with you and with all of these amazing uh, library workers and, and I hope the cultural folks who are taking notes and now are just big on libraries, big on libraries. But your time is coming um, because we're gonna say uh, goodbye to these folks. We're gonna take a two minute very quick break and then Commissioner Finkel Pearl is waiting in the wings. We'll start the cultural affairs portion of this budget hearing, thank you.
Commissioner, would you like to uh, take the appointed seat? How are you? You good? Good to see you. All right, we're going to begin shortly. Those rowdy librarians, lot, rowdy library workers. Um, so just a reminder, after the commissioner testifies and responds to questions, uh, then we're going to go to the public testimony. And uh, I know a lot of folks have been waiting um, but because uh, libraries went first, we're going to take a panel on libraries uh, first and then culture, and we'll see how many panels we have if we need to rotate. I think there are more folks uh, to testify on the cultural end, um, but uh, we will endeavor to have everyone be able to testify as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And the sergeant at arms will let us know when we're ready to go. We're good to go. All right. Um, welcome, Commissioner, and welcome to everyone for the uh, cultural affairs portion of the preliminary budget hearing of the Cultural Affairs Libraries and International Intergroup Relations Committee, of which I'm the chair. Uh, we have members in and out, but I want to recognize Councilmember Francisco Moya from Queens, and I know uh, others are coming and going. So before Commissioner Finkelpearl is able to testify, he needs to uh, be sworn in by our council. If you can please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? Yes, I do. Thank you. And let me just say before uh, Tom Finkelpearl testifies that we've been able to do some uh, good things with respect to the Department of Cultural Affairs budget over the last several years. Uh, some things I'm, I'm really proud of. On the city council side, we've been able to do remarkable things with our council cultural initiatives. But working together, we have seen some increases. We want more. We need more. And the cultural community deserves more, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm uh, saddened to see the peg that the Department of Cultural Affairs received um, uh, be as significant as it is. And um, I, I won't speak for the commissioner, but I, I believe that we all in this room know that the city of New York is, is better when the cultural community is funded in the ways that we know they need to be funded uh, because of what that means to the people of the city of New York uh, and our, our very values. So I want to also recognize that we're joined by Council Member Joe Borelli from Staten Island as well. So uh, with that, Commissioner, we'll hear uh, your testimony and questions, and then we will go to public testimony. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Um, I actually just wanted to say one thing before I begin my testimony. Um, a great staff member of ours, Tim Thayer, has retired. I think everybody knows that. But it was interesting because I've also, there, a rumor went around that I am retiring because of the Tim and Tom connection. We kind of look the same. I would like to dispel that rumor before I begin my testimony. I am here. I do not plan to leave. Um, so. I did I, not expect you to begin your testimony with the proclamation that you are not retiring. <laughs> but, uh, I just thought I'd clear it up because I've heard it several times now. Thank okay. you for clarifying. Um, so I will now begin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Ben Bramer and members of the committee. I am uh, Cultural Affairs Commissioner Tom Finkelperl, 
here today to testify in regards to the Mayor's Fiscal Year 2020 Preliminary Budget Proposal for the Department of Cultural Affairs, which is DCLA. I'm joined today by a number of my staff from the agency. First, I'll review the numbers from this year's preliminary budget proposal. The agency's proposed baseline expense budget for fiscal year 2020 is $151.5 million. This includes $28.6 million for the Cultural Development Fund, $109.5 million <clears throat> for the Cultural Institution Group, $1.25 million for the Energy Coalition members, $7.1 million for agency operations and other expenses, and $5 million that was baselined at adoption for the 2019 budget. It's important to note that this is a preliminary budget proposal. These figures do not include any initiatives or other one-time additions typically added at our budget adoption. Our 2019 baseline budget, as presented at this hearing last year, was $142.1 million, or $9.4 million less than this year's. After incorporating one-time additions, uh, I just, the one-time additions I, that I just mentioned, DCLA's fiscal year 2019 budget came to 200.3 million, DCLA's largest budget ever. Uh, this investment in the cultural life of our communities is thanks in part to our strong partnership with the City Council, led by, speaker, uh, by the Speaker and Chair Van Bramer. It also reflects a continuing commitment to the goals of Create NYC. I'll discuss some of these in more detail later in my testimony. I'd also like to highlight that the agency continues to be an incredibly efficient funder Operating expenses represent just 3.4% of our overall budget. This means 96.6% of our funds now flow directly to the cultural organizations and neighborhoods. They make our city a cultural powerhouse. Our process for distributing next year's funding is already underway. Applications for the fiscal year 2020 Cultural Development Fund were due last month. The panel review process starts soon and will run through June. As always, we appreciate the Council's support and involvement in this important process. There is a seat at the table for the Council on every panel, and we value the collaborative input. Turning to capital, DCLA's five-year capital budget currently allocates $1.15 billion to ongoing projects at more than 200 cultural groups. These projects are essential to cultural organizations and audiences in all five boroughs. They ensure access to the best and most efficient facilities and equipment, this, variety, this varied portfolio encompasses everything from purchasing AV equipment to construction of entirely new facilities. But across the portfolio, energy efficiency has become a major priority in recent years, especially following the release of Create NYC, which called for more green capital investment. Highlights include the Brooklyn Botanic Garden uh, has <coughs> nearly completed the multi-phase redevelopment of the South Garden which features numerous water conservation improvements through the installation of a comprehensive system to capture rainfall, filter and recirculate captured water, reduce the use of fresh water, and minimize storm water overflow while also creating a new botanical water garden display. The Staten Island Children's Museum received funding to upgrade their temperature control system. This will provide more efficient management of heating and cooling for collections and patrons alike and the added, with the added bonus of being on demand and automated, reducing its operation from 24 hours per day to an estimated nine or 10. We're working at the Bronx Museum to support the renovation of their South Atrium, which will include installation of more energy efficient windows and an upgraded HVAC system. The Dance Theater of Harlem will also be upgraded, will also be upgrading their outdated HVAC system, as well as their boiler and fire safety systems to make them more efficient and effective. The Queens Botanical Gardens new education center will be a 15,000 square foot facility including teaching kitchen and teaching greenhouse, further supporting the organization's mission of celebrating plants and cultures through learning and real world applications of environmental stewardship. As you can see in these environmentally oriented projects, Create NYC continues to influence DCLA's priorities, programs, and budget this year. In addition, new grants programs and initiatives are pushing forward cultural plan priorities on multiple fronts. For instance, another major priority for the plan is forging stronger connections between city resources and cultural sector, which we've pursued in a number of ways. Following the mayor, mayor's grant for cultural impact successful pilot year in 2018, this year we expanded it, providing 500,000 for 10 partnerships between city agencies and cultural organizations <coughs> to fund programs benefiting underserved New Yorkers. They include five renewed partnerships from the pilot and five new partnerships. For example, Pan America will work with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment to host free writing workshops for immigrant communities 
in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And the Weeksville Heritage Center will partner with NYC Commission on Human Rights to trace the history of Bedford-Stuyvesant through its black-owned restaurants. DCLA launched Public Artists in Residence, or PAIR, in 2015 to embed artists in city agencies where they work alongside staff and constituents. The artists use their creative practices to help address some of, the, of our thorniest civic problems. Since then, we've placed artists in collect in, and collectives in nine PAIR residencies. And we're continuing the program with four new city agencies <clears throat> on board to host artists this year, the Department for the Aging, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Department of Records and Information Services, and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Working with the Department of Buildings and the Mayor's Office, we created City Canvas last fall to allow public art installations on the city's 300 miles of sidewalk sheds and construction fences. The omnipresent structures are essential to public safety, but they can be uninspiring to look at. After an open call seeking interested cultural organizations, we've selected Studio Museum and Art Bridge, who will commission artists to beautify these neighborhoods uh, through the throughout the city. We hope to celebrate the first installation under this program in the spring. We've also made deliberate efforts to connect our constituent cultural organizations with city resources and to bring them together at events and programs. In September, we convened a group of mid-sized organizations to learn how to secure contracts for arts and education services in New York City's public schools. Our partners at the Department of Education's Office of Arts and Special Projects presented detailed information on their uh, contracting process. This met our goal of expanding access for, the, for our constituents as the DOA seeks to diversify the organizations offering services to schools and students. In October, we partnered with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to co-host What Can We Do? Immigration Summit for Cultural Organizations for nearly 200 representatives from NYC arts nonprofits. The event served as a forum to discuss how the cultural sector, along with city government, can work in solidarity with our immigrant neighbors, many of whom are the, at the core of our arts and cultural communities. In February, we worked with the Mayor's Office uh, for People with Disabilities to host Disability and Inclusion in the Cultural Workforce. An event of over 150 uh, <coughs> representing, an event for over 150 people representing over 90 cultural organizations. Attendees heard personal perspectives of people with disabilities working in the arts. They learned about local, state, and regional resources, offering support in developing more inclusive recruiting, hiring, retention practices. Two citywide projects have become powerful tools for helping reduce economic barriers to participation in NYC's cultural life. IDNYC, the city's municipal identification card, is now in its fifth year. Among the card's wide range of benefits, it continues to provide cardholders with free one-year membership at 40 cultural partners, now including Leslie Loma Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art. 2018 saw the launch of Culture Pass, a new initiative administered by NYC's three library systems, Library called card holders can use their cards to acquire free passes to over 45 cultural institutions in all five boroughs. DCLA was able to facilitate announcement about Culture Pass on Link NYC, kiosks across the city, and provide funding to support re related programming at library branches in traditionally underserved neighborhoods. Create NYC also outlined our long-term commitment to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in New York City's cultural landscape. To this end, we have worked to build an emphasis on diversity into the agency's funding at every level. Fiscal year 2019 was the first year that Cultural Development Fund, the CDF applications, included questions about each applicant's efforts to hire diverse staff and reach diverse audiences. To further include accessibility for all qualified organizations to extensive programmatic funding that DCLA offers, Fiscal year 2020, CDF applicants benefited from enhanced support to their application submission process. This is in addition to services already offered, such as the 12 application seminars held annually at locations across the city. These enhancements this year included now an online version of the fiscal year 2020 CDF application seminar presentation with closed captioning, drop-off tables at cultural locations in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and Upper Manhattan, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the application date of February 11th, and technical assistance for CDF applications, including extended hours of the CDF help desk, and finally, in-person drop-off at DCLA offices, which stayed open until 11.59 p.m. on the evening of the deadline. 
The members of the cultural institution group are being required to adopt full diversity plans that set benchmarks and increase accountability. These will be completed uh, later this spring. We've worked closely with them to figure out how to produce plans that translate into concrete improvements towards cultivating a more inclusive cultural sector. In August, we announced uh, the grantees of the new Create NYC Disability Forward Fund. The fund provides programmatic support for organizations deepening their commitment to people with disabilities as artists, cultural workers, and audiences. 22 organizations in a variety of disciplines receive grants of up to $35,000. Projects range from creation of new work featuring disabled artists to re-examining collections through the lens of disability aesthetics to training people with disabilities for employment in creative careers. The CUNY Cultural Corps continues to go strong. In 2018 to 2019 school year, over 130 students from 16 CUNY colleges hold paid internships with 63 cultural institutions throughout the city. This means that at the end of just three years, a tremendously diverse group of 340 students will have received excellent professional development and experience in the working world. They have provided over 62,000 work hours to the cultural sector. The Create NYC uh, Leadership Accelerator, a newer partnership with CUNY, attempts to address the lack of diversity in high-level positions at cultural organizations. The program, which is free of charge to the participants, provides professional development and leadership skills training to diverse groups of mid-career cultural professionals. After a successful pilot cohort in 2018, the program has just kicked off its second year serving 52 participants this year. We're particularly pleased to be able to substantially increase funding for local arts councils. In partnership with the city council, we provided five borough um, councils with nearly $3 million, which in turn went to individual artists and community-based arts organizations. Artists are at the heart and soul of New York City, and this investment helps ensure that they have the support they need to stay living and working in our communities. In January 2018, uh, Mayor de Blasio released the final report of the Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers. As you know, I co-chaired this commission alongside Derek Walker, president of the Ford Foundation. The commission was charged with developing recommendations on how the city could address um, monuments and markers on city property that are the subject of a significant public debate. In the last year, a significant amount of progress has been made in acting the commission's recommendations. In, re in response to the Monuments Commission's report, the Public Design, Co <coughs> Design Commission is now undertaking a one-year project to review the city's art collection. The first phase of the project will result in a public online database of outdoor monuments and memorials and is planned for completion in August 2019. Nearly a year ago, the city removed the controversial statue of J. Marion Sims from its pedestal on Central Park and committed to working with residents to commission new artwork for the site. As part of the process, the Committee to Empower Voices for Healing and Equity, made up of local stakeholders in East Harlem, Department of Cultural Affairs and the Department of Health was formed to spearhead the Beyond Sims initiative. Its goal is to ensure ongoing community engagement throughout the art, um, artist selection and design process. Using a percent for art process, five finalists have been selected and will submit proposals in the coming weeks. Last summer, First Lady Shirley McRae and former Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn and Women.NYC launched She Built NYC an initiative to honor remarkable women who contributed to New York City's rich history through the creation of public monuments on city property. DCLA is pleased to be part of this endeavor. Nominations from over 2,000 New Yorkers generate a list of 300 worthy individuals, groups of women, or events in women's history. Based on that list, five new monuments, two women, one in each borough, have been announced starting with Shirley Chisholm last November. This will essentially double the number of uh, monuments honoring real women from history in the city's collection. It is a step on the path to more fully, accurately, and equitably reflecting the stories and contributions of all New Yorkers in our city's public art. I'd like to wrap up with an update on city council initiatives. Together, these programs would be larger than the entire cultural budget of most American cities. We hope to see these um, uh, funding for these initiatives once again added at adoption. And they are, the Coalition of Theaters of Color receives nearly $2 million in fiscal year 2019, enabling 44 organizations to serve audiences, artists citywide, and greatly increase the number of people of color whose stories are shared through the theater. Over $6 million went to 182 organizations as part of Cultural Immigrant Initiative. I think we can all agree that New York City, a city of immigrants, can only benefit from amplifying the voices of people from all cultural backgrounds. 
Art as a catalyst for change continues to form important collaborations between arts organizations and elementary and middle schools to mobilize communities against gun violence. An even larger opportunity to bring art and the li uh, into the lives of New York City students is the Cultural After School Adventure Program, or CASA. 765 programs, 15 in each council district, were funded for this current academic year. In my days working in the museum world, I saw firsthand how great CASA can be. It's much more than the huge opportunity to provide in-depth after-school programming for kids in public schools. It can also create strong ties between cultural organizations and individual schools. And it gave us, the cultural uh, institutions, the chance to work in-depth with talented teaching artists. Last but not least, since New Yorkers of all ages benefit from art and culture, we have SUCASA. In addition to serving seniors through over 250 programs, this partnership with five borough arts councils enables us to provide employment for over 100 teaching artists. Since I've been commissioner, I've, had the, I've made it a point to visit a number of SUCASA programs. All were received well, <coughs> were well received by the senior centers and their clients. This program is a great model for creative aging initiatives around the country. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much, Commissioner Finkelpearl, for um, ending your testimony with a great review of the City Council's cultural initiatives. I am uh, extremely proud uh, of the work we at the Council have done. Um, just looking at those initiatives, um, just in the last several years, while I've been the chair of the committee, we have uh, um, increased that pot by over $20 million to now $33,600,000 at the council alone, which is um, a significant investment in the council. So I wanted to begin um, addressing a couple things. Uh, since you uh, uh, began your testimony by talking about uh, Tim Thayer retiring, um, I saw that your 2020 preliminary plan for your agency reflects uh, two fewer staff members than you had the previous year. Um, I don't know if that reflects uh, Tim's departure as well, but um, uh, why the reduction in, in staff? And a broader question is, do you have enough staff at the Department of Cultural Affairs to move the funding that you do receive through as quickly as you need to move it through? Yes. Yeah, so the, those staff members, uh, the, the headcount reduction, which was something that happened you know, at quite a few agencies, don't, re don't have a bearing on the uh, moving of the grants through. So one was at the building community capacities, um, and the other was, I believe, at Materials for the Arts. What's that? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It was an HR line that hadn't been filled for a while, but it wasn't one that um, has any bearing on the CDF unit or the cultural. So Tim, that Tim Thayer line, the director of the CIG unit, which he held for 25 years, is, is still there. Uh, these were, again, in areas of the agency. Look, it's never easy to, to cut staff. Uh, these were vacancies that, that existed, and they don't affect the speed with which grants are processed. Do you have enough staff to move all of the money through as quickly as you could. Obviously, we have seen a tripling of CASA in the last five years. We've seen new initiatives like the Cultural Immigrant Initiative and Sue CASA. That's 10 million additional dollars. Mm -hmm. um, talking about 22 million or so in new money. Uh, that uh, the City Council has uh, added just in the last uh, five years. And are you able to effectively move that through given the staffing levels that you've got? Yes, I, I believe we have adequate staffing levels. Um, it's you know very, very hard working group of people. It's especially seasonal that there are you know crushes of work that happen, especially in the fall and the spring, especially for certain parts of the agency. But that's a kind of cyclical. It is a you know uh, a group of people that is large enough to process the the workload. There was uh, you mentioned in your testimony the five million dollars uh, that was baselined at adoption 
uh, for your agency last year. Um, what is that five million for? And, and so I. If I'd like to answer it by saying we got $20 million at adoption. I can go through exactly how that money was, because I think also I've just heard that there's a rumor that not all of it has been spent. It all has been spent. Uh, and I'd like to just say, so the, of the $20 million, $6.5 million went to the Cultural Institution Group for increases. $5.25 million went to the across-the-board increases at the CDF. And I'm happy to provide you with this uh, document. Or, um, 1.45 million went to the Cultural Institution Group with special um, targeting of what's called the SIAP neighborhoods. The Social Impact of the Arts was a study done a couple of years ago that identified na neighborhoods in the city that were particularly underserved. Um, the Individual Artist Grants and the Borough Arts Council, $2 million went to that, I think, as you know. Uh, Create NYC initiatives um, were $3,550,000. Uh, $3, and that includes uh, the CUNY Cultural Corps, Disability Forward Fund, Mayor's uh, Grant for Cultural Impact, and then the Energy Coalition, which are those groups that are on our property that are our tenants, which are not CIGs, got the $1.25 million. So that's where that money went. The $5 million was never specifically designated within that, but the $20 million is accounted for and was all spent. And I'm happy to provide that uh, to you. That so then back to the original question, so the five, of the five million that you said was not specifically designated for any one particular thing, yes. uh, has all of that been spent? Yes, and yes. How that's that? included in here, yes. So it's just sort of? It's included in here, it was never pointed, that five million dollars was never pointed at a particular program. Right. It was, it was something that was being worked on. Right. Right, so we're seeing that it's still in the office of the commissioner. Um, <coughs> right, in the program area for the office of the commissioner and has, has not been spent, that's what. No, the money, I, I honestly, I mean, I can uh, assure you the money has been spent. It was spent, this accounts for the entire $20 million. The $5 million was $5 million. Of that $20 million was added adoption was baselined. The entire $20 million has been spent, therefore that $5 million has been spent. And again, I'm happy to provide you with this. Um, okay, I suspect we'll be following up. So, okay. uh, because we're talking about the baseline portion of that, let's talk about your PEG. Um, and uh, it is larger than the PEG for most agencies uh, in the city of New York. And from my cursory look at every single agency in the city of New York. Um, you are in the top 10 uh, with a 4.1% uh, cut to your agency, 6.225 million. Um, have you had conversations in the administration about why the Department of Cultural Affairs received such a large peg? So we, um, you know, have been speaking with OMB since the PEG uh, targets were announced. So, I mean, I've seen the list as well of all the agencies. You know, there are agencies um, that were in this same range, you know, three or four percent is, is a large percentage of the agencies. Some of the very big agencies, which had huge cuts in terms of amounts of money, like DOE. Um, yeah, I'm not asking percentage. about DOE. That's not the Education Committee. That's the Cultural Affairs Committee. Com yeah. So let's, let's talk about the PEG to the Department of Cultural Affairs, which, yes, your overall budget is smaller than the Department of Education uh, and the NYPD. But as a percent of your budget, it's larger than most of the cuts um, that are being proposed. And what I'm trying to get at is why is the administration in this PEG program de-emphasize the importance of culture and the arts. Well, I'm not sure that I completely agree with that, saying de-emphasizing the importance of culture and arts. I mean, by giving a disproportionately large cut to the Department of Cultural Affairs, you are de-emphasizing the importance of the arts and culture in the city of New York. Uh, so the the our cultural budget is still by far the largest cultural budget in America. Uh, 
it is proportionally also much larger than many other cities. So I don't think it to say that we have, you know, 151 million dollars reflects a, uh, you know, disregarding of arts and culture. Obviously, you say this is disregard, but let me just ask you to answer the, the question that I asked. Obviously, Deputy Mayor Glenn is 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 no longer with the administration and therefore um, not uh, directly overseeing the Department of Cultural Affairs. So who is it that you're speaking to about this? And who is the champion within this administration for this community? And have you received an answer, if you've asked the question, as to why DCLA received a disproportionately large peg? So the, um, the answer to the first part of the question, which is, you know, who's my boss at this very moment? So the uh, portfolio of Alicia Glenn has not yet been distributed out, so my boss at this moment is Dean, uh, who's the first deputy mayor. I have not yet spoken to him about this, but this is something that is absolutely, you know, on the agenda to be discussed in my first meetings with, uh, with my new boss. And my new boss, you know, will be a deputy mayor who will be assigned, hasn't obviously been assigned yet, but that will be something I'll be speaking directly to, to Dean about. Well, these are important days, so I hope we have some clarity to those questions, uh, both for yourself, but also for the community um, uh, at large. And, and again, we are not disputing the fact that the City of New York and the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, has a funding level that is larger than virtually any place in this country. Um, but we are also the largest city in the country, and we are the cultural capital of the world, and we should have an even greater budget. Just and let me emphasize also, it's not just any city, it's any state, any right. city or state. Next to the federal government, we are number two. And there's nobody close. And again, yeah, we should be bigger than every city. We also have the biggest fire department, the biggest police department. Sure. Um, but we should have an even bigger budget for the Department of Cultural Affairs yes. to actually serve the city, and that's why you know we're disturbed, and and you know we we understand the administration is going through this exercise, but um, when I looked at the number, and I look at the number, uh, it's larger than a lot of other agencies, and and you know I I am concerned when I see that. I assume you are as well. I think if you ask any commissioner uh, whether they are happy to be making the cut, they're going to say they're not. I think it's also a new financial reality that we're in, uh, in terms of the way, you know, I mean, we have experts who are looking at tax revenues and how they're coming in and how much money we have to spend. And that's why the mayor asked for $750 million of cuts. And, you know, it's been the first time uh, since I've been commissioner that we've had uh, a peg, uh, and we're you know trying to figure out exactly how uh, to address it. But I think it, you know, of course, uh, if you ask me, could we spend more money responsibly? The answer would be yes. But it's also you know again just to reiterate, still you know by far the largest amount of money in any city in America. Right. So let's talk about how we're going to fight it and not accept the fact that we're going to be making cuts, right? Um, I, don't, I don't accept that uh, framework. So um, what is the plan to, to fight the peg? And if, it, if, if our fight weren't successful, where are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? So, I mean, look, I'm, I'm part of the administration. I'm presenting the administration's preliminary budget. So, you know, obviously there's going to be ongoing discussions that we have that, that are happening citywide with all the different agencies about how to address it. We have just gotten, you know, on Wednesday, uh, the target, the PEG target. So we are, you know, looking to do something that's fair that doesn't uh, cut pro disproportionately from uh, either the CIG or the program groups how to keep going some of the uh, programs that we've done that, that, that do cost money. So a lot of the programs that were in the cultural plan are not actually about money, they're about policy. So obviously things like the diversity uh, planning can go forward. 
Um, but so we, so we have uh, you know, a lot of math to do, and I think that the, um, how the cut would be distributed, again, what we had a $5 million baseline increase, and then a $6 million peg. So we're $1 million uh, less in terms of the money that was uh, allocated to each, each of these uh, funding categories compared to where we were last year. So, you know, that's stuff we haven't, we don't have an answer at this hearing to that. This hearing is presenting, you know, the preliminary budget, and the PEG is quite a new thing that we're working on now. Right. So I just want to say $5 million baseline increase, $6 million cut does not equal a $1 million cut. It equals a $6 million cut, right? Let's be clear. Um, we can't do that fuzzy math here, right? Like, because people are going to see less. And, and so it's, it's, it's a reduction. The reduction is the reduction is the reduction, right? We're yep. not, um, and we shouldn't um, uh, try and make it seem like it's less harmful than it really is. Um, so, uh, so what is your exact peg for 20, FY20? Six million dollars. So there's the peg for this year is the two hundred and thirty thousand or whatever it is, which is you know the it was as opposed to other agencies we've already given away the money right we can't do a peg a mid year peg uh, against the groups that that are sitting over here um, so it's a very small peg this year so the almost the entire peg is next year so that's the six million is for next year right which makes it even worse somehow um, to uh, throw it all into next year's, um, uh, I mean, the, the coming fiscal year's budget. Um, so that's really problematic. And you have not had a conversation yet with anyone in the administration about this because you don't yet know who you are directly. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, no, I've been speaking to OMB. I just haven't been speaking to a deputy mayor yet. OK. And obviously, Dean, is, uh, as the first deputy mayor, would be a good person to talk to. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, all right, I have some more questions, but I'm sure my colleagues, oh, and we've been joined by uh, Council Member Karen Kozowitz, uh from, from Queens. I know that Council Member Borelli has uh, some questions, so I'm going to ask him to do that. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner, I just want to stay on one topic. Um, I sent you a letter, and I'm not criticizing you for not responding it. It, it was only sent uh, last week. So, uh, but now that you're here, I just want to ask uh, some questions about historic Richmond Town. C can you tell me how the, the, the Quonset huts that were built there, uh, how that project came to fruition, and who approved those designs? Yes, and I was just at the board meeting there uh, last week. So those uh, facilities, it was a DDC capital project, uh, and that they were designed, built, and installed in collaboration, of course, with the historic Richmond town. In other words, it's not something where they just show up one day. That for years, there was a discussion back and forth on that. Sure. Does DDC handle most of the DCLA capital budget? DDC and EDC, and then there are projects that are called CCGs, which are uh, capital uh, you know, cultural capital grants and funding agreements with EDC for organizations that are doing their own capital projects. But yes, DDC does a large number of our capital projects. Who approved the design of them? Was that a, a, a DCLA approval or DDC approved it? Or so, I mean, we're, we're the funding agency and DDC is the construction agency. Um, but that's also done in collaboration with the cultural institution. Um, and then the actual design is, is approved in terms of what it looks like by the Public Design Commission because it's on public property. Do you know of any other example where uh, a project that was funded through DCLA's capital budget uh, has not met, I don't even want to say it just hasn't met specifications, um, can you cite any other example of DCLA-funded capital projects that have no functional use whatsoever? Uh, when you say they have no functional use, they're not being used presently because there are problems. So uh, I well, they're, they're can't. not artistically pleasing, you know. So they're not they're not 
beautiful things in and of themselves, but they're there to store yes. carriages, and they can't store carriages. I mean, is there any other, um, you know, I noticed you have the Met Skylights uh, capital project, and that's wonderful. I love the Met. I, I imagine they're being replaced because they're not functional anymore. That's correct. So why would this project not be sort of on the same height of priority? I mean, it seems to me that, that both DCLA and DDC have sort of thrown their hands up and said, well, you know, we signed off on it, we can't get the money back, and now we're just uh, SOL, as they say. Yeah, so I mean, I looked, I, um, we're, you know, formulating a response. We did get, just get the letter. I'd be happy to visit the site with you and talk to you about what can be done. I think it's absolutely the case that in the long run, those, uh, we call them concert huts, call them storage units, uh, will have a function that the carriages will move in there. I absolutely um, hear your frustration, and it's something that has to be fixed. So I and that, and that goes into the second part of the problem, yes. though, is that is that where does the money come from? Because a, a, an individual council member, sure, collectively we have a, a large capital budget, but each member is typically given only five million dollars. Um, am I going to have to go back to my the money that's designed for my constituents in this year to somehow fund a, a, a rehashing of this project? I mean, you have a one point one billion dollar capital budget. Is that where it's going to come from? That's a four-year plan. That's everything cumulatively. That's so you have other, a, a lot of that is million dollar capital budget a year plan. I mean, right? So yeah. I have a five million dollar capital budget per year. So I have twenty-five million over four years. You have ten times more than me. Yeah. Is that? Can we find somehow the money to repair this? Look again. I I don't know the specifics well enough. Again, Just I have yes. visited those. Just say yes. But I would be happy to visit the site with you and work out a solution. I, I feel that, you know, the way you do, that those things need to work. We need to find a function. We need to figure out what the problems are and fix it. Um, so I'm happy to, to visit the site with you and figure I, it out. I look forward to visiting with you, and I hope our friends from NYPL bring their little catchy lo um, umbrellas <laughs> because we're going to need them if we go. I know that the front the part, I know that there's, I, I understand the problem. Again, I'm not the capital guy. We, we should visit with DDC together. Uh, with my capital unit, uh, I'm happy to go with you to that site. R rest assured, I'll be asking DDC the same questions. I'm uh, sure you will. Uh, yes. Appreciate it. Thank you. And and by the way, I just I want to. Can say you at least admit they're ugly? I mean, they are ugly. No, no, Boy, that's they, actually mean, what I was gonna say. I mean, so, somebody in the Public Design Commission. Yeah. I mean, th the Public Design Commission is actually highlighting this as one of their achievements, which is beyond me. I mean, it's like someone smoked pot and watched mash and put Quonset huts uh, in the middle of a historic village, but. Yeah, so I mean, look, I, so that, that's where it comes to opinion. And I actually kind of think they look great. I think the DDC, they are off to the side, by the way, just so everybody knows. They're not in the middle of the historic village. They're off to the side. They're large scale, um, you know, uh, buildings that were built to hold the carriages. So that uh, aesthetic decision was certainly not mine. That was not yours, obviously. But I'm happy to go there, and the functional question must be solved. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so first, let me just say I appreciate the Staten Island realness that Councilmember Borelli is bringing to this hearing. And you got some Queens realness, too. So um, to make it um, uh, even more citywide, Brooklyn, I think, has some questions for you as well uh, with Lori Cumbo. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here today. Wanted to jump right into the questions that uh, Councilmember Van Bramer brought up. If these were already answered, I can refer back later. So the peg that is astonishingly being put forward, what will that actually impact? So that, so listen, we just got the peg numbers on Wednesday. Uh, we haven't, we're working on that. You know, there's gonna be more news as the, uh, as you know, the next weeks come forward, but that hasn't been assigned yet. So when they make a reduction in that way, in terms of cost savings, it's just done with a blunt tool. It's not looked at very carefully in terms of detail of what this will impact. Will it impact the programmatic groups? Will it impact the CIGs? Will it impact the other programmatic groups? It's just, we've made a 
reduction of $4.1 million or whatever it is, deal with it. And then it's up to you to figure out where that cut comes from. So I wouldn't say that, but I would say that there's quite a bit of input by the agencies on how they uh, plan to execute the PEG. So they, uh, OMB and you know the whole the group that put together the citywide PEGs does have opinions about uh, how the PEG should operate, but it's absolutely up to us to work with them to understand uh, where the cuts could come with the least pain. I think the challenge with it is because all of us all know each other very well and we all know each other's backgrounds and we all know the things that inspire us and that are our passions and why we get up in the morning and do the work we do every day. But this is just astonishing with all of the work that we've been doing all of these years to try to basically increase a wrong of an agency that has been systematically underfunded for generations. And so now we're at a place where we've just done a cultural plan and we've gone to all five boroughs to talk about what it is that the arts community needs more of. And now we're at a place where with all of the work that we've done and all of the anticipation we've garnered for how this cultural plan is going to be uh, implemented throughout the city to see such a dramatic reduction um, or to move backwards in any way is really a departure uh, from that, and to me, I've really always seen the arts, and this is not the right wording, but it's the cash cow of New York City. It's one of the few agencies that actually brings forward revenue to the city. So if we continue to minimize the reason why everyone's coming to New York City, we're going to really hurt every other agency, and I know many other people don't see it that way, but when we look at our hotels, our restaurants, when we look at transportation, when we look at our local small businesses, when we look at our schools, when we look at all these different things, you know, from Broadway to the smaller cultural institutions in the outer boroughs, this is really the bloodline of New York City. And I can only see increases that would dramatically attract more people to the city. I mean, we, we've seen it time and time again when you see a public art project like the Gates that comes to Central Park, we see dramatically the impact that it increases the revenue in the city. So I just don't understand us moving backwards in this way and increases that we've made in the past should not justify why we would see a decrease of this magnitude? Well, I mean, I think obviously a lot of what you said is very similar to what, what we've said. Uh, I think arts and culture are extremely important to the fabric of the city. Um, you know, obviously the tourism side is not my bailiwick, that's NYC and company, but it absolutely does tie in. You know, that half the tourists- They're married. Is, <laughs> yes, half the tourists that uh, come to New York City uh, rank arts and culture as the first or second reason that they came here. So again, look, we're, we're looking forward to what might happen uh, at adoption as, as what has happened in, in previous years. This is a $151 million budget is still, uh, I, I just don't, don't think it's quite fair to say it's minimizing it. I think that there, this is you know, a very large amount of money which the sort of core services, a lot of the core services of what we do are funded here at a, at a level that's, um, you know, that's adequate to get the job done. So again, you know, I think as I said before, any commissioner is going to come forward. I'm not disagreeing with what you just said. Uh, I'm just saying that these are you know, the realities of our financial situation right now in terms of tax revenues. What's coming into the coffers, something has to be done, and that's why the mayor asked for 750 million of cuts. I'll pause on that because I could go on and on and on for days in that way. But again, this is an agency that does bring in revenue for the city and we can't, um, the challenge is that, and we know expenses increase every single year. So even to stay flat is a reduction. So it's the ability to continue to move forward and to lift up all boats through an increase in the cultural world um, has beneficial impacts for everyone. I wanted to talk very specifically to the project in my district. Um, I asked earlier about the Brooklyn Public Library um, and the other organizations that are part of it. It's been very difficult to understand where in the timeline 
uh, this process is happening because it's always disappointing when development happens with uh, cultural or not-for-profit spaces and they're very much considered an afterthought in terms of the development. Yeah, so you're talking about the Ashland Place across mm -hmm. from BAM. <clears throat> so look, the, I think you know, we've talked about this before, but again, I'm also happy to have a, a meeting with you specifically to give you the, all the details. This is a situation in which you know, the property has to be transferred to the city. There's a condo deal. And then the, then the condo is licensed to the cultural groups, which is 651, Mokata, and the, and the Brooklyn Public Library. And BAM. And BAM, theaters, yes. Sorry, BAM. Um, yeah, so there's four cultural organizations, or three cultural organizations in a library, however you want to say it, uh, ready to go. And the, look, this is something uh, that was, there was a um, newspaper article about this last week, and right. the EDC said we are dedicated, we're coming to the finish line quickly on this deal, and we want to get started soon. So again, I'm happy to give you all the details with the people that actually know all the details. But I you know, am watching this. I'm trying to push it forward as much as I can. Folks at EDC are doing the same thing. It's a complicated negotiation for a building, for a residential building. So there's all kinds of questions about you know, access and you know, who's going to use which elevator and all these kind of very, very specific questions that are being negotiated and try to get to the finish line <laughs> on that. So we do want to. We have the money in place. We have designs that look great that are ready to go, and we, we need to get the condo deal done so that we can start construction. Everybody agrees on that. I'm All of that confusion that you just put forward in terms of the complications and then the we want to see it done quickly. The quickly has been a long quickly. So it's, it's difficult to get through those complications in order to arrive at uh, where we need to be for this particular project. So yep. definitely would like to and appreciate have a conversation with yep. you further about it. I just want to just close with one more question just to get an understanding of the, if, and I apologize, Councilmember Van Bramer, if you've already done this, but given that it's Women's History Month, I certainly want to focus in on She Built um, NYC. What is the timeline now, now that we have introduced uh, five different sculptures, pleased about the selection of all of them and the placement? Can you talk a bit about what is the timeline for this project? So, and thank you also for your uh, wonderful advocacy on behalf of Shirley Chisholm. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the others in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island. We have now, the announcement has been made, the sites have been selected and artist selection is going to begin. So again, the timeline, um, I believe that the announcement was 2020 and 2021, they will be finished. Uh, so it's our percent for art team is working in each of those uh, boroughs to put together panels. And you know the percent for art process is, uh, you know, it's, and actually it was community board, with more community input that was uh, mandated by a law that you all uh, sponsored last year. We know it so, well. You know it well. All that is happening on each of these process projects, so there's that community engagement. So process. additional resources have been put in the Percent for Art program to complete these projects? Yeah, so yes, we did. We were able to hire an extra uh, person. So there's now uh, uh, an extra person whose job it is specifically to work on the monuments. Yeah, because we knew it would be a lot of extra work, and it, so the resources were simply human resources. It's not a, a matter of money. The money is capital money, but we have to execute the process. So just in closing, on the Percent for Art program, now that we've actually increased the amount of money that can be spent on the Percent for Art program, I asked this at another hearing, but would um, uh, like a further update. Where are we with the Percent for Art program now that we've increased the budget? Has the amount of public art been expanded to include more public art throughout the city, or are you still working with the same threshold? So the, what's happened is that the projects that are being commissioned have higher amounts of money associated with them. That is cut, kicked in. That's already started happening. So the number of projects we're working on is similar, but plus the women's monuments. So it is, so what didn't change in the law was sort of what's applicable, what kind of project gets a percent for our project. What happened in the, with the law was there was a higher threshold per year in terms of the cap, but also a higher amount of money per project. 
So what it does is much better, bigger, more fabulous projects. Uh, and then what's really increased the numbers is also been the, the addition to the, of the she built and the monuments. It's not just she built, the monuments commission. So there's, there are more projects being done citywide. Some of them being done through Percent for Art, and some of them are being done with the additional $10 million of capital money that was associated with the Monuments Commission. And how do you, with the Percent for Art program, and I've always had difficulty understanding this because there are so many capital projects throughout the city that millions of dollars are going into many different capital projects. Mm -hmm. How do you select which project is going to qualify for percent for art pro program? So there's, there's things in the law that actually indicate that. So things like if it's a below grade, you know, uh, DEP project that's really pipes under the street and you don't see it, that wouldn't qualify. It has to be, or if it's something behind closed doors where the public can't get to it, so it has to be a public site and there has to be a public manifestation, uh, you know, in above ground, whatever, in public. Uh, and then it's a matter of prioritizing on the basis of, you know, the size and prominence of the public art, uh, of the uh, capital construction project. So something like, you know, a very prominent library or all schools um, or a park will get a project where something, you know, that doesn't have a lot of uh, foot traffic and is distant will not. So that's a, that's a negotiation with the other agencies. And then we have the cap. So we, you know, negotiate up to the cap. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you have a cap of amount of money you can spend per year. I do, but the only thing is, like you use the word, all due respect, you use the word prominent, right? Yeah. So everybody's prominent might be different. So I would like to figure out a way to create a more, I guess, democratic process because the pipes under the ground are one thing. Totally get that. But then there are so many projects that are above ground from parks to libraries to cultural institutions. I would love to see in my dream world, but it doesn't have to be a dream in terms of housing, projects that qualify for affordable housing. Um, many of these buildings are being built without an artistic eye or component to create any level of uniqueness to the design. I would love to see more elements like that. Um, because many of these buildings, the only artistic thing that's happening might be the big chandelier in the lobby. Yeah. So it's, you know, we want to see more than that um, in the design. So I look forward to talking with you more about that when we have our meeting. Sure. Okay. And I'll That'd turn it back over I'll to Councilmember Van Bramer. Right. Thank so. you. So, Commissioner, I just have to say, I heard you say something in response um, to a Councilmember question that disturbed me a great deal, and that is, that with the PEG, you said that it would be adequate, adequate to get the job done, right? And I just want to say, with all due respect, I know that you work for the mayor, but you are also the commissioner of cultural affairs. And we need to see more fight in you, right? It is horrible for you to say that with this cut, the funding would still be adequate to get the job done. That is not true. And even if it were true, we damn sure shouldn't be putting up the white signal, the white flag of surrender at this particular stage in the budget negotiations, right? We need to be fighting like heck and making sure that everyone understands that that is not adequate to get the job done. We need more money, not less money. And you and I were there during the mayor's Queens Week to make the very announcement that we had finally eclipsed $200 million in the budget for the Department of Cultural Affairs, an all-time record, right? And I know you want that and fought for that with all of us, but here we are, less than a year later, looking at a really substantial proposed cut to that number. You and I were there it was part of the mayor's big week in Queens and, and part of his big announcement. Um, so what we should all be talking about and what I think that folks within reason are looking to you for is, is that fight, right? And that leadership to say, when you're in those rooms with Deputy Mayor of Poolahan and others, right, that you're, that you're banging on tables and overturning tables. Right, because I know that's what I'm doing. 
in the budget negotiating team, right? We fight like hell for the people that we represent. And, and, uh, and so I, I just want to ask if you'd like to revisit that, because there is no way that we should be saying at this stage that a $6.2 million cut is adequate to get the job done in terms of adequately funding the arts and adequately representing the people that we serve. Uh, <clears throat> so what I can say is, so first of all, I'm not, generally speaking, a overturning the table guy, but I'm also not a guy that has, I mean, I think that you've seen the results of our budgets over the last years have been excellent. And I'm going to do what I've done in previous years, which is to be a good um, champion of the important work that the cultural, these folks over here do on behalf of New York City. So that's how I will operate, which is I'm gonna operate as I have in the past. Uh, so I can you know, obviously assure you that, that I'm, I am a voice in the administration that, that says that arts and culture is paramount, paramount to the health of the city. And we've seen that in terms of economics, as Councilwoman uh, Cumbo said, you know, the, the, the tourism side, it's also paramount to the health of, of low-income communities that aren't necessarily tourist attractions, that having arts and culture is demonstrably a good thing for those communities, as was proven in the social impact of the arts study. Absolutely true. Do you believe that we will have the resources adequate to get the job done if we receive a $6.2 million cut to the Department of Cultural Affairs? I think at the, you know, that the funding level proposed, I'm, I'm proposed, I am here presenting the mayor's budget. And this is how the Cultural Affairs Commissioner, I've been at these hearings on the other side of the fence for years, as well as on this side of the fence, that this is the, the basic budget that we have now. We'll see what happens with adoption. I am absolutely convinced that we have spent well the taxpayer monies with this $200 million budget that we celebrated out at Flushing Town Hall. So again, I'm going to be the advocate for my agency within the administration. Okay. Um, uh, you know, look, I want to be respectful. Uh, I want to re be respectful to you as a commissioner and to your role within the administration, um, understanding that there are certain limitations uh, uh, to what you can do and what you can't do, what you can say, what you can't say. But, you know, I don't think I'm the only person in the room, right, who would, who would, who would, who really wants to feel more passion, right, for this fight, right? And, and we're different people, we have different styles, right? I have banged on tables um, when it comes to the budget for the things that I care about. Um, and, and that's fine if you have a different style, but I think in terms of these fights, <clears throat> in terms of this community, in terms of our leadership, you're the commissioner, I'm the chair, and all these folks depend on us to be able to fight Right, people are, are, are looking and yearning, right, for more, particularly when we, we, we feel this and we see this. Um, and there are, you know, generalized feelings that maybe this administration doesn't love this community as much as it should, right? But you and I are the equalizers here. Yeah, right? so by the way, I never said I hadn't banged on tables. I said I hadn't overturned tables. <laughs> I would like to make that distinction. Um, no, look, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I am passionate about it. I also think that, that the proof is in the pudding. The best budgets we've ever had is this year. I mean, to say that the administration doesn't care about arts and culture in a context where, and, you know, I had a lot of people, a lot of the advocates fought for it, a lot of you, you fought for it on the council side, but you know, which would you rather have? I mean, that this is an administration that does care about this issue, that has, that did the cultural plan, that spent every spare moment of an entire year, not spare moment, every moment, uh, listening to 20,000 New Yorkers and another 200,000 people sure. online. So I do think that we're passionate about it. 
I think that we have, and the, and the results have been terrific. You know, we I, have gotten increases, starting with the elimination of the old budget dance. So, yeah, but we're dancing right now. So um, let me just say, I'm very careful with my words, generally speaking. I did not say the administration doesn't care about oh, arts okay. and culture. Okay. All right, I, I worded that differently. Um, uh, I, I, will, I will just say we need more, we need better, um, and, and this is a fight um, for our lives, and we should look at all of these sorts of fights right, as, as, as a fight for our, our lives and for the things that we believe in and the values that we care about. So this is the beginning. This is the preliminary budget hearing. Uh, but I assume this group believes, as I do, that there's a lot of fight in us um, to make sure that we get what we and the people of the city of New York deserve. So with that, I am going to say thank you to Commissioner Finkelpearl for being here. Uh, look forward to um, continuing this discussion. Thank you very much. And we are going to, uh, uh, we have several panels. Um, we are going to hear from a library panel first because they've been waiting for hours and then we're gonna hear from uh, the first cultural panel and I'll mention all the names right now. So for the libraries, it's Victoria Cohenetz, I believe, uh, Danielle Shapiro, uh, Coquila Frank, I hope I got that right, uh, and Lamian Isaac. Um, what's that? Lamine. Very sorry, Lamine Isaac. Uh, and then the cultural panel is going to be Inez, uh, Asian, John Calvelli, Kathy Hung, and it looks like Sarita Deaf Dunny. Okay. Yeah, that'll be later. Okay. <laughs> Yes. So in the interest of hearing from everyone as quickly and efficiently as possible, we're going to go to a clock. Um, so I would just ask everyone to be as succinct as uh, possible with your uh, testimony. Uh, we're going to do this library panel, then we have a cultural panel. And then we have a couple more library folks, which we may intersperse with some cultural folks, and we'll continue on from there. Who would like to begin? Who's Victoria? Good. We are going to start with Victoria. Is it Coenetz? Did I say it right? Could you put your uh, microphone on, the little red light? Covenants. Ah, OK. So I've mispronounced every name on this okay. panel, apparently. Um, <laughs> Okay, go for it, Victoria. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and the members of the Libraries Committee. My name is Victoria Covenant, and I am a children's librarian at the Seaside Community Library in Queens. I am honored to be here to tell you the amazing work we do at the Queens Library. One of my fondest memories is of my mother bringing my sister and I to the library. I especially remember receiving my own library card. As I signed my name, I felt so proud to have my li Queen's Library card, which at the time was blue and white, in my possession. I remember my mother telling me stories of how my grandfather used to take her to the Central Library to pick out books. She would also use the bookmobile whenever it would come by. Now, being an employee of Queen's Library, I feel everything has come full circle. I can share my love of books and reading with others, just like my mother did with me. One of the things I love about the library and my job is that the library is a place that means many different things to a diverse group of people. We help children do their homework, assist adults in their job search, and conduct digital liter literacy classes for seniors. We help customers achieve their goals, find their purpose, or just escape the world for a little while with a good book. We have arts and crafts programs, movie viewings, and book clubs. The times of libraries being solely book dispensaries are long gone. We have so much to offer our customers. As a children's librarian, one of my most favorite things is having a new child come to story time. It is great to see the transformation and progress from their first visit onward, from being shy and just learning the story time songs to leading the group and welcoming new children joining the group. It is a rewarding and fun experience. I am grateful that I can have a positive influence on a child's life through my work at the library. That is why I am here today. I witness the wonderful impact libraries have on every individual who walks through their, our doors. 
Our patients, our patrons rely on us to be there for them, and we want to be there for them, but we need continued investment in our library systems to allow us to do so. Without investment in the public library systems, our customers will not have a reliable and welcoming space to receive free programs and services. I hope the city council and administration acknowledge the importance of public libraries by increasing financial investment in them. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify here today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, members of the Cultural Affairs and Library Committees. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for support of the libraries and taking time to listen to me this afternoon. My name is Danielle Shapiro. I work at the High Lawn Library located in Bensonhurst, the only circular branch in the system which opened in 1972, previously housed in a storefront on West 6th Street. The libraries today provide a place where all ages and ethnicities are welcome. During a regular day, we provide programming to all ages. Some of the programs we provide are toddler time, babies and books, after school homework help, um, library lab, robotics, teen tech time, and teen time, which were an area where children can, um, teens can socialize. For our adults and older adults, we offer dance classes, computer classes, painting and writing classes, jewelry workshops, citizenship classes, and English as a second language, both classes and conversation groups. Some of the branches also offer conversation groups in other languages, such as Japanese, Spanish, and French. I am involved in two initiatives with outreach services, the book cart service, where we visit local jails, allowing people who are incarcerated the opportunity to access literature during their stay, and answering letters sent from people who are incarcerated, requesting information that will assist them when they re-enter society. In my 20 years working for the Brooklyn Public Library System, I have the, had the opportunity of working in various locations throughout Brooklyn and meeting many families. Over several occasions, I have seen parents at outreach events or other locations, and they thank me for getting their children their first library cards and assisting them in the library. They are proud to tell me that their children are still active library users today and successful either in high school or have graduated college. I, like many of our youth librarians, do outreach to schools and child care centers, reading stories, hosting parent workshops, and introducing new titles we feel children or young adults will enjoy. It's heartwarming when the child remembers you later. On my way home the other night, a young girl smiled and waved, recognizing me from my visit to her school. All of our libraries have seen an increase of patrons coming in to access the internet, both on our computers and via the Wi-Fi we offer. Ms. Shapiro, they can are, I ask you to um, uh, okay. maybe read that paragraph and conclude there? And, yes. and, uh, uh, but I, I promise you I'm reading your testimony and, and, uh, and love it. Yes. All of our libraries have seen an increase in the patrons coming in to access the internet, both on our computers and via the Wi-Fi we offer. They are working on resumes, schoolwork, and social media, allowing them to keep in touch with family and friends. After a full day of studying at school, the children and teens use the computers to play games, to unwind. Very often, the library is the primary source of access for our low-income New Yorkers. Thank you once again for taking time to listen to my testimony. Thank you very much for your 20 years of service to uh, the people of Brooklyn and the city of New York. And both of you happened to mention uh, a first library card moment, either your own or providing that for a young uh, reader. And uh, I got my first library card at the Broadway Library in Astoria, Queens. And it is also one of the highlights of my life uh, that day. So thank you very much for reminding us all of that moment when we got our first library cards. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Coquila Frank. And uh, good afternoon, Chairman Van Buren and the library committees. Uh, I work for Brooklyn Public Library with Sunset Park Branch. I'm also the constituent of uh, Sunset Park. I've been living there for about 44 years. I came to the United States in 1975 I, after I got married and have always lived there. Like I was saying, like with the first library card, my, it was a paper card and then it was uh, mailed to my house in 1975 and I still have that card. I worked uh, for the uh, Wall Street for nine years and then was a stay-at-home stay mom for 14 years. All these years, I have always come to the library for books and videos. Ever since my children and my church children were very young, I brought them to the library. They loved the books, 
children videos. Various children's programs, arts and crafts, and love reading is fundamental, where they got free books every three visits. In 1997, I joined the BPL staff as a part-timer. On March 15, 1999, I became a full-time clerk. I will be retiring on March 29th after 22 years. And uh, just to say that I was um, also happily married for 44 years. We have grown here from catalog box, then stamping due date cards to catalog computer and other IT technologies. At this time and age, when technology is on the rise, we require updated computers and other devices. We are in need of capital budget as well. Most of our buildings are aged and are in need of repair and other amenities. But we thank that uh, Sensor Park is going to get a new library. We thank all the elected officials who also love the libraries and have always supported us. I have been to Albany 15 times for lobby day in all my uh, service here. All the officials promised us help, and I'm glad to say that they have fulfilled them. I request all of you humbly to provide us with more funding so we can provide children, young adult, adults, seniors with their needs to develop in their lives. We also have various programs in the branches, but our Sunset Park branch, this is the March calendar. If you see, it's all full. We have a lot of different programs for it's, children. It's a little far away and slightly small print, but I'm just going to take <laughs> okay. your word for it. Maybe, you know, while I get up, I'll just uh, give you a copy. Uh, we, uh, as you see, uh, we have a lot of programs, but at this time, we have the robotics competition, and Sunset Park was the first place. We won the first place, and this Saturday, coming Saturday, we are going to be competing for the first LEGO League State Tournament where 64 teams will compete for championship at City College of New York. And then if they win, they'll go to uh, Nationwide. I think it's going to be in Detroit. I once again, I thank everyone for this opportunity to bring before you various programs and funding needs for our libraries. I also especially thank Nyla for our government affairs and especially Ms. Benavides. She's a very good leader and she uh, inspires all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. I feel like we learned a lot about you in the last two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you so and much. And you're also very inspiring because um, I would like to one day say that I'm married for 44 years. Thank That's you. That's pretty cool. Um, I would also like to one day say I retired. Um, and <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool too. Um, as well as you, I wish I had my first library card. I don't, I don't have no, that I, anymore, but. Yeah, they uh, laminated it and they would mail it to us. We would go, rec uh, you know, uh, fill in the form. Right. We'll issue the library card. It was a paper, like just a paper like this. Right. And then they would laminate and mail it to us. At yeah, home. no, I think I had that, but, but you kept yours. Yes for a long time and mine is long gone. Um, so thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Frank. And thank you. Lamine? Yes. All right. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Van Brema. It's a pleasure to see you again. Um, and good afternoon, Library Funding Committee members. Uh, my name is Lamine Isaac. I'm the branch manager at the Macon branch. It's a Carnegie branch located in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. It's also a landmark building. I thank you, committee members, for your generous support of public libraries over the years. Due to your generosity, Macon Library is able to be open for 53 hours a week, seven days a week. So we are addressing that seven day week need in Brooklyn. For over 100 years, the library staff in Macon has been serving the community. As a direct result of service hours, our multi generational programs and attendance have increased significantly at Macon. Due to the funding of the library committee, collaborative partnerships and numerous programs, excuse me, collaborative partnerships, we offer programs and services for all ages, as many of my colleagues have already spoken about. Also with the assistance of the increased library hours, we are able to form partnerships. We were able to just recently offer a OSHA class, which stands for the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration class, a 30-hour OSHA class, which we know is extremely important. We were also able to support mother coders, which allow mothers to learn coding here at our library location. And patients who participate in that program were able to be, receive free childcare, which is amazing. Um, the library is a safe haven, as you all know, 
for many of the New York City most vulnerable young children, older adults, the homeless, and many others. With continued and increased support from the library, from the committee, the library will be able to increase their outreach in the communities that they serve. Patrons serve will benefit and the library will be, continue to be a place of lifelong learning opportunities and discovery. But as you know, the library has structural needs because we've been forced to close our doors several times due to extreme heating conditions, whether it's too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter. Um, we also have issues with elevators. We use trash cans to collect water that pool in the buildings when it rains or snows. So, funding committee, I implore you to please continue to support the public libraries and increase funding so that we can continue serving our communities and so that we can address the infrastructure needs of our buildings, especially Carnegie buildings that have been serving the community for well over 100 years. So committee, I thank you, and I implore you to continue to support us. Thank you very much. Thank you. We thank you for all of the work that you do uh, on behalf of the patrons and residents of your various communities. And, and uh, you know, I, I, when you said that when you got your first library card at the Seaside branch, right? Well, I, got, I work at the Seaside you work branch, at Seaside. but I got mine at Howard Beach. Howard Beach. And then when you got your job at the Queens Library, it was like full circle. I had that very same life experience, um, having worked for the library for 11 years before I got elected. So uh, I really appreciate the work that all of you do on behalf of the people of New York City. So we say thank you to you. It's our job to fight for uh, people and libraries and and I love that more than anything in the whole world. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And we will hear from uh, John Calvelli, Kathy Hung. Um, I think it's Inez Asian. And I think it's Sarita Daftani, but I could have that wrong if those four folks are still in the room. I know I have John and Kathy. And are you Sarita or Inez? I yeah, Sarita. Sure. Which one? Sarita. Sarita, okay. And is Inez Asian from the New York Historical Society? Um, no, if not, we will call someone else. Uh, next up on the list is Arthur Aviles. All right. John, start. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm John Calvelli, Executive Vice President for the Wildlife Conservation Society, Chair of the Cultural Institutions Group, and a founding member of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. I'm here today to provide testimony on behalf of the CIGs, a coalition of 33 cultural organizations who share a public-private partnership with the City of New York and are located in all five boroughs. Let me begin by stating how grateful we are for the Council's vital support for culture in New York throughout the years. Candidly, having sat through just the testimony before, your leadership and the inspired leadership of the council is one of the reasons why we have the funding and the level of support that we do in government today. Like many of the CIGs, WCS has roots in diverse neighborhoods throughout the city, and our parks connect local youth and families to science and conservation through accessible and inspiring programming. I'll cut through and just basically say right now, we are collectively just WCS. Last year, you had over 1,400 young people uh, that worked and learned at WCS in communities um, where the poverty rate ranges from 20% to 42%. More than 70% of the youth who work, intern, and volunteer at our parks identify as young people of color. They hail from 30 different countries and speak 31 different languages. WCS, like the CIGs and the cultural community, are more than just what our mission t states. We not only inspire youth, but we provide them with tools to transfer their gateway experience into their long-term career goals. I think you raised that very well in the prior testimony. We're much more than just these institutions where people come to look at art. Uh, they're being inspired every day and they're creating incredible opportunities. I also serve on the board of NYC and Company, and candidly, the results have shown that 77% of people coming to New York are coming for a cultural experience. So the fact is we are, candidly, a major uh, revenue provider for the city of New York. Long story short, um, we 
we come here to say we want to be held harmless at, um, at 20 million, but now I guess it's 26.5 million based on what we just heard. Um, we would ask that the council look at the feasibility of bringing our funding levels back to their FY09 level. We're still not at our FY09 level. Both CIG and program groups are supportive of using the same distribution model that has been used for the past three years. I can go on, but I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing, and we look forward to working with you through this legislative and budget process. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is Kathy Hong. I'm the Executive Director of the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, JCAL. I'm here to testify on the New York City Cultural Budget for Southeast Queens. JCAL offer a comprehensive era of in-school, after-school programs. Our School of the Arts, with more than 300 enrollments every year, offers people of all ages the opportunity to pursue their crea creative expressions. Through our various educational programs, JCAL employed more than 35 teaching artists last year. JCAL has a long history of supporting both established and emerging artists through residency and pro professional development programs. Last year, JCAL offered more than 14,000 free studios hours to artists. Our workspace residency has supported artists for more than 30 years by offering dedicated workspace and financial support. Our newly launched co-workspace program supported local artists and small cultural organization at a rate of 200 per month for a secure private working space to operate their small business. Our Thursday night jazz concert not only provided perform performance opportunity for emerging jazz musicians, but also brought in local homeless shelter residents to experience live jazz music. Many of them are the first time to a jazz concert. Did I mention our new free college access program? Last fall, the inaugural class of 18 students by end of this February, we have learned six of them has been admitted through early action process to Columbia, Cornell, John Hopkins, University of Chicago, and Vanderbilt, all with full financial package. Um, why college access? Because we can. Because we want to make our resource available to the community. We happen to have an expert on our staff, so I bend his arm and make him do it. Um, next year, we are going to launch a new partnership with Department of Probation and Transitional Service in New York, a mental health service and institute in Queens. So budget cut is not adequate. We actually need more, we need more for what we want to do next year. So your support is very important for us to continue our work. We ask for a total of 30 million of cultural budget to be allocated for all New York City culture. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, hi, um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Sarita Daftry, and I work for Just Leadership USA. Um, we're probably best known for the Close Rikers campaign that we've launched in New York City. Um, but here today, we're here to talk about divesting from law enforcement and investing in the kinds of things that actually make our communities safe. Um, so uh, under the, the Build Communities umbrella, we convened groups um, across New York City last year, uh, 60 representatives from 30 different partner organizations and advisors, and 200 residents of communities most impacted by mass incarceration. Um, and we asked people what kinds of investments they thought would actually create safety. Um, and we heard libraries and cultural institutions coming up again and again and again. Um, just to, since we've mostly been talking about cultural budgets today, um, just to give us perspective, um, the city invests $7.3 billion in, in different kinds of law enforcement every year. Um, so all of the things that we've all been talking about funding, uh, we have the money, it's just all given. To, it's disproportionately given to law enforcement. Um, and in doing so, our city applies law enforcement solutions to problems of public health and wellness, poverty and inequality. So, a few of the needs that we heard when we spoke to people um, in this past year about investments in communities. Uh, people asked for investments in public libraries to expand educational and recreational services. Uh, we support the tri uh, budget increase requests for expenses and, and um, capital. Um, people mentioned expanding services like ESL classes, computer training, task preparation and career counseling, uh, offering expanded free resources like meeting space and printing expanding the diversity of library offerings, including programs and materials in multiple languages and increasingly representative of New York City communities, and investing in learning centers focused on activism and social justice. 
Um, people also mentioned establishing creative spaces, spaces and cultural hubs in communities for all creative disciplines, increasing funding to expand creative spaces and cultural hubs that are accessible to the entire community, and to support and sustain community institutions that serve as creative spaces and cultural hubs. So I'll stop there because you have my written testimony as well. But um, just to summarize and say that we know that uh, we are speaking to the choir, but we want to be supportive in any way that we can to help you all challenge the approach through which the budget is always made, which is resourcing law enforcement first. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I uh, obviously am familiar with the organization, <laughs> um, but when you started uh, uh, to speak, I, I, I was wondering where we were going, <laughs> um, and then I could not be happier. I mean, obviously, I, I think I'm pretty progressive on these issues anyway, but but the fact that um, your organization is is taking a position based on the feedback that you've received, you know, on behalf of both libraries and I would argue our culturals really are an extension of that, mm -hmm. right? Because if we if we put more money into libraries and cultural organizations and the education and the outreach and the free services and everything, you know, we would dramatically change our society mm -hmm. in so many ways. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, you, you wouldn't need jails if you had libraries 24-7 and, and culture and the arts in every school and in the life of every child, regardless of zip code and income. And, and you know, they're the best institutions we've got and the most democratic institutions we've got, which is why I'm proud to be the chair of this committee for the last 10 years um, and fighting for these things. So I just think it's a really great perspective, though, that, that your organization coming from where you're coming from uh, in terms of this particular part of the social justice movement are there for libraries and, and culture as well. And, and I think if the folks in the room who represent libraries and culture are smart, they'll be getting your number two <laughs> and saying, how do we amplify each other's voices? Let me give you my card. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so speaking of one of those great artists and cultural uh, organizations that I love um, in the Bronx, um, yeah. the very talented Arthur Aviles. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for hearing us out. Uh, so my name is Arthur Aviles. Um, I am the co-founder along with Charles Rice Gonzalez, who is the executive director and I'm the artistic director of BAD, the Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance. It's an organization that's been holding space in the Bronx for artists and audiences by providing works that are empowering to women, people of color, and the LGBTQ communities um, for the past 20 years. Um, through our programming, we support the presentation and development of work by over 200 artists per year. For example, we support Barbara Herr, a, uh, a Bronx artist, performer, and advocate for the queer and transgender community. In her words, BAD is an essential creative home for me and many other artists who are trans, Latinx, and people of color. It's not easy to find places to create and present work, but BAD has provided support, a stage, and pays me as an artist for my work. So BAD has presented Barbara Herr's shows, and she has been featured in our Transvisionary Performance Series, um, where we work with South Bronx restaurants to present transgender artists. Our work in and out of our space um, expands the visibility of um, our artists and creates the foundation for societal change. BAD values Barbara Herr and the hundreds of artists who work in our space each year and the thousands of people who experience their art. Our audiences are 87% people of color, 65% women, 74% um, identify as LGBTQ, um, and we stand with fellow cultural warriors to ask that the FY20 cultural budget be kept at $20 million and for the council to consider additional funding for both CIG and our program group partners. We ask that the 10 million total that culture has previously received be baselined, inclusive to the 2.25 million baselined in last year's budget for CIGs. Please distribute the initial 10 million as you have in the past three years. 4.5 to CIGs, 
0.5 million to program groups and 0.5 million to CUNY Cultural Corps. Um, and divide evenly between the CIGs and our program group partners, uh, the additional 10 million uh, plus any enhanced cultural funding allocated in um, FY20. So BAD loves New York City, we love the Bronx, and thank you for your dedication to keeping the city strong and for funding the arts. And uh, we thank this committee for all your fierce work um, in these matters. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, I saw Barbara Herr perform at a gay club in Jackson Heights when I was young enough to go to gay clubs in Jackson Heights. And, uh, and the movie Chicago had just come out. And uh, she did a number of the uh, songs from Chicago, She's fierce. which is an amazing experience that I had. Um, and uh, so thank you for the work that obviously you do in creating a safe and welcoming artistic space for the LGBT, queer, trans community. Really, really important, obviously, to me as a gay man, but also to all of us. So, um, and we love your work. And uh, we love you. Charles Rice Gonzalez as well. So, um, I, uh, needless to say, with respect to this panel, you know where I am, and I am passionate about these things. Um, so, I will be fighting uh, with everything I have, even overturning tables. If it I was going to say, will you be overturning tables? <laughs> You gotta do what you gotta do in this business, right? <laughs> and and it's, it's in the interest of good, um, you know what I mean? There's so much happens in our world that isn't good and so much happens in politics and government that isn't good. Fighting for libraries and the arts is about as good as it can get. So um, uh, turning tables, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's an Adele song, but um, uh, it's really, really, uh, important work and, and we will all fight together for the things that we know are important. Thank so thank you very much uh, to this thank panel. Uh, next we have Demetrius uh, Morrow from the Chocolate Factory is Demetrius, Demetrius. Uh, Lucy Sexton uh, from New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts, Mark Rocher from the New York Foundation for the Arts, uh, and Rocky Bucano, the Universal Hip Hop Museum. And then we have one or two more panels after that. Is it Demetrius? Demetrius. Demetrius, yes. yes. We'll start with you, Demetrius, and then go down the line to Rocky. Okay. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Chairman Van Bremen and members of the committee for giving me this opportunity. Um, my name is Demetrius Morrow. I'm fairly new to New York City um, and just started working at the Chocolate Factory. Um, our executive director, Sheila Dendowski, could not be here and asked that I give my story as to give a face to the fight for arts and culture. Um, we at the Chocolate Factory stand with New Yorkers for culture and the arts asking for a 20 million increase in 2019 to be baselined in 2020 um, with additional $10 million in 2020. Um, so 109 Willowbrook Drive, Clinton, Mississippi, 39056, located on a corner lot, housed a very intimate uh, cultural space that my family knew as the stage. Um, the stage served as a vital place for not only like ex creative expression, but um, love and support and like development of self. Um, growing up in Clinton, Mississippi, I sometimes felt like I was like the weird kid because of my blackness my articulate speaking voice and like my shyness in the world outside of my home. Um, and, but on the stage, my parents highly encouraged me to like explore my creative side um, and even put up with weekends of me rehearsing, <laughs> recreating scenes from movies like Step Up and Honey on that stage. Um, my first professional dance experience happened when I became a member of Rat Pack, which stood for Reject All Tobacco, um, a like, high school dance troupe that went around to younger elementary schools in Mississippi and talked about the effects of tobacco, and that was funded by the Department of Health um, in Mississippi. So it was this situation that I began to understand how creative expression really like progresses society as a whole. Um, and then after high school, I went to the University of Mississippi, um, but quickly realized that the culture of Ole Miss wasn't, was deeply rooted in racism and like 
elitism and that was not the place that I wanted to be. Um, after witnessing students protest the second term of Barack Obama and even like getting rejected from a fraternity just because I was black, I went home for a Christmas break and didn't return the spring semester and went to community college the next semester and took time to reflect on like my role in the world and questioned life in general. Uh, like why was I no longer dancing, but also like why did Mississippi state boundary signs say the birthplace of America's music? Um, and why did the car tag say that we were celebrating the creative economy and how we were, how were we doing that? Um, and what does New York City claim? As we heard earlier today from you, um, we claim to be the cultural capital of the world um, as uh, deputy, Combo, I think she said. Mm -hmm. uh, she like, said uh, we were the cash, like arts and culture is a cash cow. And um, we also heard that uh, arts and culture are the fabric of New York City. Um, whatever the claim may be, uh, New York City attracts people like me because of like the lore of the stage with, that has rich culture and uh, serves as a place of hope, progress, and healing. Um, Chairman Ben Bramer and to the, uh, all of the council, I imagine that each of your homes is um, rich with music, artwork, and a stage of your own, like the brick stage that I had at my house. Um, so give more for the city's uh, Department of Health to support performances like the group Rat Pack that I was in, for arts education, uh, to support labor of artists, and so that diversity in this city can be celebrated. Um, and as Pablo Picasso once said, every child is an artist. The problem remains of how, how can they can remain an artist once they grow up. Um, the responsibility of our, of our, to our city is to support artists in every, in all, or the artists in all of us at no matter what age, what age you are, sorry. Um, again, thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, a great journey through your, um, young life, and uh, I appreciate the, the storytelling with the powerful message um, behind it. And um, as you well know, the Chocolate Factory is in my district, so I look forward to working yeah. uh, with you uh, in the coming months and years uh, on all things culture and the arts. Sweet. Thank you. Next, Lucy. Hi, Chair Van Bremo and uh, City Council members. Thank you for your critical and greatly appreciated work supporting culture in our city. I'm Lucy Sexton. In addition to being a choreographer, a director, a Sukasa teaching artist, and lifelong New Yorker, I'm the head of a cultural advocacy group, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. We're a coalition of groups and individuals across the five boroughs working to ensure every New Yorker has the right and opportunity to engage in culture, to express their humanity, to strengthen their community. I thought it was interesting at Speaker Johnson's State of the City uh, that at the end of it, talking about transit, which was great, he listed all the things that made New York City great. Three quarters of them were cultural, from the Mermaid Parade to Spike Lee. So we know culture makes our city great. Today, I want to emphasize the proven data that shows how engagement with culture improves nearly every aspect of the many challenges facing New Yorkers. It's a fact. When kids have access to culture, more of them stay in school and out of the criminal justice system. When neighborhoods have spaces to gather to share music, stories, dance, ideas, community is created and strengthened. When seniors have access to classes in gardening, painting, movement, they live longer. Fact. Last week's New York Times had yet another article detailing the proven impact of arts on learning. The article reports that the effect arts made in overall learning was largest among the children who were less strong academically, the, quote, lower performers. Quote, we found the biggest difference with children at the lower level of achievement. Could this be at least one lever for closing the uh, achievement gap? I've included the article in my remarks. I hope you get a chance to read it. Too often, people talk about New York's culture, going to a museum or a botanic garden or a poetry reading like it's decorations we put on a tree and the arts, as we see, are always the ones that are cut first, that has to stop. I want to compare us not to the cultural budget of other US cities, but to Europe. 3.6 billion euro is what France spent on culture last year, the majority of it going to Paris. That's what we should be comparing to. Uh, we all know that this, the culture is at the roots of what makes this city great, and we know that not all of the roots are getting the water they need to survive and thrive. That takes funding, which is why we're here today. New Yorkers for Culture and Arts is asking that funding for culture be held harmless at $20 million. 
We ask that $10 million put in last year's budget be baselined and that there be an additional investment of $10 million to go evenly to the CIG and program groups delivering culture to citizens throughout the city. It's a huge job and we do it with a shoe, on a shoestring. Uh, we ask that you support the groups that are doing so much with so little. By supporting culture, you're supporting better education, better aging, improved mental health, stronger communities, and a city that respects the dignity and humanity of every one of its citizens. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer, members of the committee, for calling this hearing and for the really incredibly tireless work you do. I mean, it's kind of inspiring being here and hearing these testimony and hearing your testimony. Uh, my name is Mark Rozier. I'm the Director of Grants at the New York Foundation for the Arts, and I'm here today to ask if the Council baseline last year's game-changing $10 million increase and provide an additional $10 million to be divided between the program groups and the CIGs. Support from the Department of Cultural Affairs is vital to NIFA's operation and allows us to provide critical support to artists, administrators, and the arts communities. These funds support our fiscal sponsorship program, which last year helped individual artists and emerging organizations raise over $4 million, most of which is spent right here in New York City. It allowed us to provide professional development to support to over 7,000 artists in programming in Mandarin and Spanish. It supported our website, which is used by over a million people annually and posts over 700 jobs and opportunities every month. Again, the vast majority of these jobs are in New York City, thus creating employment opportunities and tax revenue. Last year, with DCLA support, we provided in-person workshops and information sessions multiple times in all five boroughs. And finally, DCA allows us to provide cash grants to artists. DCLA support also provides us with organizational skill and stability, which allows us to work with the city in other ways. For example, on February 28th, working with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, we were proud to announce the recipients of the first ever Made in New York Women's Film, TV, and Theater Fund, which awarded $1.5 million to film, media, and theater projects with strong female and female-identified perspectives. 63 projects by those who identify as women were funded, with 56% from artists of color and 10% from trans, gender nonconforming, and queer artists. New York is the first major city in the country to have a program of this sort. This, of course, is no surprise, since there is no other city in the country, or the world for that matter, with the richness, diversity, and excellence of New York's cultural community. It's a community which supports the city in so many ways, and I hope the city will do its part by baselining last year's 10 million and providing an additional 10 million this year. Thank you for all you do for our spectacular city. Thank you, uh, Chairman Van Bramer, for allowing me to speak. My name is Rocky Buchanan. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Universal Hip Hop Museum. The Universal Hip Hop Museum is a new project that is going to break ground in December as part of the uh, Bronx Point development project in Mott Haven. Uh, so people ask me all the time, why a hip hop museum? Uh, hip hop is one of the most powerful artistic revolutions to emerge from the United States. The story of hip hop's development and global rise offers insight into the power of creative self-expression in marginalized communities. This history and culture deserves preservation and representation in a world-class museum setting. The Universal Hip Hop Museum will be the first major institution led by insiders of the culture to celebrate and preserve the past, present, and future of hip hop, designed for multi-generational audience, audiences. U UHHM exhibits will present the rich history and culture of hip hop through innovative, immersive multimedia learning environments. Uh, we've partnered with MIT, we've partnered with Google, we've partnered with Microsoft, we partnered with the National Museum of African American Culture, Cornell University, and other major institutions. So we're bringing a large, diverse array of global educational partners and technology partners to bring this project to life. We're seeking $6 million, million to help us with construction, new construction of the corn shell for the, uh, for the museum. Uh, we know that this project is gonna be uh, widely uh, uh, embraced by the community and the global community to, to that matter. And you'd be proud uh, to know that uh, your queen's uh, native son, LL Cool J, sits on our board. So uh, we represent all five barrels, not just the Bronx, and we're proud to represent hip hop on a global platform in the Bronx. 
Thank you. You ended with the best thing. <laughs> um, and I love Cool J. Um, uh, thank you all for for being here, and uh, look forward to the uh, the fight um, with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have one more cultural panel, and then one last library panel. I believe that's a a library panel. Yes. Um, so I think I called before. Inez Asian is is back from the New York Historical Society. Uh, Lisa Alpert, is Lisa Alpert still here? Yep, from Greenwood Cemetery. Uh, Francine Garber-Cohen, is Francine Garber-Cohen here from the Regina Opera Company, I believe? And Katie Cox from Exploring the Metropolis. And then we have Michael and Matthew Zadrozny, I think from Save NYPL um, to close it out. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to start us off? Hi. My name is Ines Aslan, and I represent the New York Historical Society. Um, we are very grateful partners of the City Council and the Department of Cultural Affairs. Just last week, we were downstairs unveiling the new portraits of the women that now adorn the walls of City Hall, never ever done before. So it's nice to be back. Thank you for having us. As some of you know, um, New York Historical Society was the first museum funded in New York, 1804. The city had been burned to the ground a few times during the Revolutionary War, and a group of New Yorkers decided that they needed to get together and preserve the history of the city through um, the arts uh, objects and documents at the time so we could tell the story of the city and the country to future generations. And it's been a while. We host about 15 million objects in our collections, and we keep expanding our reach. We serve over 200,000 um, public school students a year through our educational programs. Um, and we offer all this wide range of exhibitions that try to explain and share with visitors and students what does it mean to be an American, ranging from Nueva York about the history of the Latino presence in the island since 1504, 1507, when the first Dominican got off a boat, to um, Jewish Americans a couple of years ago, and most recently, um, black citizenship in the age of Jim Crow, which we just closed 10 days ago. Um, we continue planning on exhibitions that help people understand the wide range of cultures and people that make this country and the city be the way it is. Um, and uh, we're moving forward. We couldn't have done that without your support. And so that's why we're here today to thank you and to also share our next steps. Uh, we're planning our next project is the Academy for American Democracy. We recognize that within our student body, middle schoolers are sort of the weakest link in terms of when kids drop out of school. And by developing this program that will explain to children and their teachers the history of democracy from ancient Greece till the founding of this country and the current state of democracy nowadays, will engage them and develop a civic conscious and uh, the history of America inside them. So that's coming up. We thank you in advance for partnering with us on that. And thank you. Um, that's that. Great to see you again. And you. Um, uh, I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Sometimes oh, when we're okay. reading them, they don't, uh, they don't translate. But Inez Aslan, right? OK, so I got it right. Thank you, and good to see you again. Good to see you. The organization that you work for, as you know, I think very highly of, and mm. you all are doing incredible work there. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Chair good afternoon. Van Bramer and Committee Council. My name is Lisa Alpert, and I am the Vice President of Development and Programming at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Um, of all the cultural institutions you'll hear about today, I feel pretty certain this is the first and only time you'll hear about a cemetery. But this cemetery is a National Historic Landmark. It is Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. It spans 478 acres and borders Sunset Park, Windsor Terrace, Borough Park, Kensington, Park Slope, Prospect Park South, and Ditmas Park. 
It's very big. Uh, Greenwood Cemetery has been in Brooklyn since 1838, and you know it as the final resting place for thousands of New Yorkers. But what you may not know is that we present over 200 public programs, tours, and events every year. Last year alone, over 280,000 people came to Greenwood to attend a program, to visit a loved one, or just to stroll the historic landscape and get away from it all. Uh, to serve, um, I want to tell you about a couple of our favorite programs to serve New York City youth. We have developed a strong lineup of programs. One is in workforce development. We train young people in, uh, from low-income communities in masonry restoration for jobs in restoring historic buildings. Uh, we run environmental justice programs in Sunset Park, which uh, involves street trees and Greenwood's horticulture staff. We give school tours to over 4,000 elementary and middle school students a year. And on the arts and cultural front, we host outdoor theater, film screenings, twilight tours, classical music, and opera concerts in our catacombs, uh, contemporary art installations on the grounds, and more. And between May and September, our trolley tours always sell out, including our annual Gay Greenwood tour, which highlights the accomplishments of the many LGBTQ notables at the cemetery. Um, at Greenwood, we have a bold vision, and it is to establish Greenwood Cemetery as a major cultural institution uh, and educational institution in New York City within the 10 years, within 10 years. And we're well on our way. Okay, why am I here? Greenwood is a giant green space in the middle of Brooklyn, is a huge resource to the community, and we want to serve more New Yorkers with public programs um, and serve um, more tourists and um, people coming to New York for cultural opportunities. Our planned education and welcome center is the key. It is a capital project we want to bring to your attention. It is directly across the street from Greenwood's main entrance. Um, it is a $34 million budget. One third of the funding will come from private philanthropy, a third will come from the cemetery itself, and we are targeting city and state funding for the last third. Our fiscal 20 capital ask of the Brooklyn delegation is $1 million. Um, Greenwood has been in Brooklyn for 181 years, but it is an entirely new cultural asset and in a part of, of the borough that is culturally significantly underserved. We hope very much to work with the City Council on this important initiative. I'm happy to answer any questions about cemeteries or life and death or anything you want to talk about or even our capital project. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, it sounds like I could ask you a lot of different questions. Think many topics, yes. Um, so the, is it the Weir Greenhouse? The Weir Greenhouse, right. That is beautiful. It is beautiful. It was uh, built in 1895 and is a city landmark. We have restored it um, uh, faithfully and um, very uh, arduously. And that will be the frontispiece for a, it's, only, it's beautiful and old and gorgeous, but it's 1,600 square feet. So yeah. um, the larger building behind it will then offer the indoor space that we need. We are, as a cultural institution, we're very, very large outdoor space, but we really need some indoor space to continue our programming year round. That's great. Um, and I love what, what you're doing. Obviously, we have some cemeteries in Queens that are also yes. uh, uh, programming in the way that you are. So I heard you say there's an LGBT. Yes. Um, so I find that fascinating because obviously a lot of the folks who are buried in yep. Greenwood Cemetery died at a time when people weren't exactly coming out yeah. or yeah. Um, yeah. declaring themselves as LGBT yeah. activists. So. Um, Who's doing the research to to come up with that list, and, and what does it look like now? I, I would love to, that, I would find that fascinating. Yeah, it is really interesting. I mean, it's, you know, there are 570,000 people buried there, and statistically, there might be about 57,000 or more like, LGBTQ permanent residents, as we call them. Um, so um, we do work his, with historians and our own staff right now on that list are um, uh, Leonard Bernstein, Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, Fred Ebb, uh, um, 19th century um, uh, Violet Oakley, um, Emma Stebbins, who is the sculptor of the uh, Bethesda Fountain um, in Central Park, um, and more than I'm not thinking about right now, but um, it's a long list and, and growing as we continue to do more research through our own archival materials. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, we also, uh, for the LGBTQ community, we do a number of programs in um, through the cemetery itself, including um, death and dying in the LGBTQ com community, um, which has been a very popular program that we offer for free um, twice a year. That's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Regina Opera Company. Yep. I have my, uh, my Regina Opera shirt on. Oh, 
need the red light. Uh, thank you. I'm Fran Garber Cohen from Regina Opera Company, president and producer. For 49 years, Regina Opera has offered year-round fully staged operas and ticketed and free concerts in Southwest Brooklyn. Regina Opera performances are places where thousands of Brooklyn residents, many of them retirees, come to meet their friends, stimulating their minds and getting them out of the house. Attending our performances distracts them from their troubles. We have been told that our performances are also very high quality, which is why we pack them in like little sardines in our, in our theater. Uh, we, are, uh, we provide affordable entertainment for audiences who might not otherwise attend live performances. Some are on fixed incomes and cannot afford the tickets uh, of the major opera house. Some can't travel to Manhattan. Others are intimidated by the major opera houses or have not been exposed to opera previously. The venues in which we perform are all handicap accessible. Re Regina Opera offers matinee performances, reducing travel after dark. The response of the audience is overwhelming. 4,000 people will be attending performances during fiscal year 2019, taking advantage of low cost and free tickets. The opera tickets are anywhere between 20 and $25, uh, $15 for concerts and much less for students, including free admission. Regina Opera is unique in Brooklyn. Uh, many music schools and other groups present operas or concerts in Brooklyn, but Regina Opera is the only group pre presenting professional level, fully staged operas and operatic concerts year round and has been doing it for 49 years. Our, our company is well known in the music world for providing training and opportunities for musical artists of all backgrounds and we reflect the makeup of New York City. Regina Opera helps the entire community. The performances add to the cultural vitality which serves as a magnet for prospective residents and businesses. Most of our performances are in Sunset Park, which of course is an underserved area. We directly affect the economy of this locality by employing local residents, purchasing local goods. We even rent a storage unit right near our theater in Sunset Park. Our performers and audience members frequently shop and eat in this area. And uh, so we join everybody else in thanking the council members who support us, Mr. Menchak and Mr. Brennan, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and Brooklyn Arts Council, as well as other private and public organizations. And we request that the funding for uh, 2020 fiscal year be increased by $20 million, uh, divided among the other recipients of the New York City Council funding. Thank you. And last on this panel, Exploring the Metropolis. <clears throat> Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Katie Cox. I am a flutist, a music educator, and a teaching artist for Little Orchestra Society. I am also the program manager for Exploring the Metropolis, ETM. I'm here representing ETM, an organization whose mission I care about deeply, not only as its program manager, but as a musician myself. Since 1982, ETM has focused on solving the workspace needs of New York City's performing artists. We currently administer the ETM Con Edison Composer Residencies and the Choreographer Plus Composer Residency in partnership with Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. In the last decade, our residency programs have provided more than a million dollars worth of no-cost rehearsal space and cash awards to New York City artists. We have supported 98 composers, choreographers, and performing artists with free space, provided more than 40,000 hours of free rehearsal space, supported 80 free public programs for thousands of New Yorkers, and supported the creation, development, and completion of 79 new works for music and dance. For the fiscal year 20, we ask that consideration be given to additional funding for both the CIG and our program group partners. We ask that the $10 million total that culture has provided receive 
uh, received be baselined, inclusive of the $2.25 million that was baselined for CIGs in the budget last year. We request that the additional $10 million plus any enhanced cultural funding that can be allocated in fiscal year 20 be divided evenly between the CIG and our program group partners so that we continue to provide needs, programs, and services to New Yorkers in all five boroughs. Thank you, Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer and the Cultural Affairs Committee for the opportunity to testify today and for your support of the cultural community. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, coming by. This is your first time testifying? Yes. Uh, you did a great job. Um, uh, and I see your fellow colleague from ATM back there uh, uh, videotaping. It'll be um, going viral on Instagram <laughs> and Facebook <laughs> later. Um, so thank you, uh, all of you, for being here um, and, and for testifying at this hearing. Uh, Last but not least, uh, we have Michael White and Matthew Zadrozny to uh, close it out on behalf of libraries. All right, who wants to go first? Matthew's been waiting longer. Mr. Chairman, good afternoon. My name is Matthew Zdrozny. I'm a data scientist and a member of the Committee to Save the New York Public Library, also known as SaveNYPL.org. I've used the NYPL for 25 years. I donate money to the library through its Young Lions program, and I attend board meetings as a member of the public. Earlier today, you heard Tony Marks, NYPL's president, request more money for longer hours. I support this, but there's more to the story. The leadership of NYPL wants longer hours for branch libraries. However, they have resisted longer hours at NYPL's central research library at 42nd and 5th Avenue. For 60 years after its founding, the main library was open around 87 hours per week. Now it is open only 56. Most days, today included, the main library closes at 6 p.m. before working New Yorkers can get there. On Sundays, the library is only open for four hours. Historically, longer later hours allowed New Yorkers to come after work and stay till nine or 10 in the evening researching, studying, and bettering their lives. NYPL reduced hours in the 70s due to a budget crisis. Now the library's endowment is at a record high of more than $1 billion. The obstacle is not money, but leadership's addiction to corporate events and weddings. Save NYPL has been protesting this. We have collected some 2,000 signatures from New Yorkers who need the main library to be opened late. Over the library entrance are the words, the city of New York has erected this building for the free use of all the people. Closing the library for private events during prime time is de facto privatization and unbecoming of a great city. What is more important, cocktail parties for the connected or a quiet space for students, scholars, startup founders, and job seekers? The City Council should tell NYPL's leadership that the best way to serve the public is not through expensive and unnecessary capital projects. Instead, keep the Central Library and all libraries open longer. Serve readers, not cocktails. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for the uh, testimony. And um, I will uh, take a a look at that and, and uh, have not seen this particular uh, view echoed that the reason that the library is not open more evenings in particular is for some of their earned income events or other events, but 
I will talk to Tony Marks about that, but I appreciate your, your perspective in coming here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for getting my last name right earlier. That doesn't happen very often. Well, I didn't get many right today, so I'll, uh, I'll take the hard one that I got. But I have a very difficult last name yes. uh, that often uh, gets mispronounced, including today. <laughs> but that's OK. Um, Michael, last but not least. Michael White, Citizens Defending Libraries. Um, I support and endorse everything that Matthew just said. Um, these are images of uh, Karl Lagerfeld's library personal library, 300,000 books. That, those 300,000 books are just a few books shy a number from the number that's being talked about as the number of books that will be in the uh, reduced mid-Manhattan library. Um, that's not the way it should be. Uh, the mid-Manhattan library is designed to hold s over 700,000 books. We're talking about it being consolidated with uh, the Sybil Library, over wh from wh which over a million books are missing, um, and then all of the Donnell Library, hundreds of thousand books. Um, he was something of a polymath, but uh, these represent his personal interests. The Mid-Manhattan Library, the main circula circulating library for all New Yorkers should represent the interests of all of the libraries, of all of the New Yorkers. Um, these are pictures of the empty shelves of the Flatbush Library. Um, these were taken the day that the Brooklyn Public Library trustees held a trustees meeting above these empty shelves, quite oblivious to them, and they had a sort of goofy meeting about how to rearrange furniture in shrunken uh, libraries so that you wouldn't notice that they didn't have any space. Um, <clears throat> so I heard Linda Johnson today talk about how the replacement Brooklyn Heights Library is going to be a bigger, better configured library. Uh, that's not true. It's going to be 40 percent of the previous library. Uh, it will be not an education library, not a business library, not a career library, not a federal depository library. Uh, it won't have the same books, and in terms of configuration, it will be configured as an afterthought to what the developer wanted for his luxury project. Now, similarly, Iris Weinshaw said that the reason to sell off the Inwood Library was that it, because of its poor configuration, but when they assembled the developers to bid on the property, they said that configuration didn't matter. So what you're being told is not true, and we are eliminating books, and people like Hager, Karl Lagerfeld, who have the privilege to uh, own what's valuable, own more books than we are affording the New Yorkers of this city. Thank you uh, for also challenging my vision here. Uh, but um, I think I, I I'd like to put it up here uh, because it's always so impressive when the library um, yeah. administrators come in and they're able to do their big presentations. Um, and I'd love it if uh, for the future we can prearrange to do some great uh, shows but that everyone we, could see. We, we will talk to you about that afterwards, but I think I got the, the, the gist of it. And it It's also like, up on Citizens Defending Libraries. Okay. So. It, it looks like Karl Lagerfeld had a lot of books, um, so I'm willing to stipulate that. Um, and uh, I appreciate your, your viewpoint. Um, and, and the things that, that you've raised here at this committee meeting and others. Um, and the Queen's Library skates today. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, only NYPL and BPL um, uh, were mentioned here today, but um, by this particular panel. So uh, let me just say uh, thank you to both of you um, uh, for caring about libraries as much as you do and for uh, coming to, uh, well, Michael always comes to our hearings, but uh, Matthew, maybe this is your first, is this your first? Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll see you more regularly like we do Michael, but uh, uh, I appreciate that you come from a place of loving libraries and wanting libraries to be the best that they can be. So thank you both very, very much for being here. And with that, our committee is adjourned. Thank you.